Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, October 13, 2022. I'm Liz Sexton, the chair. Uh, we have a lot of attendees on Zoom this evening, so permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman and Mr. Hainer are here. Mr. Here Thiel yeah. Mr. Thielman, is he? He's on there. Mr. Thielman? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we have, we have a quorum, so we can keep going. Uh, tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials, also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Um, as this is our first meeting since um, Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, <clears throat> I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts tribe, part of the Algonquin group of Native Americans. The Massachusetts tribe lived on the land around Mystic Lake, the Mystic River, and the Elwife Brook, as well as a wider area that extended from what is now southern New Hampshire, west beyond Concord, and down to the south shore of Massachusetts. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located <clears throat> on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territory today. Um, our first item on the agenda are school committee appointments to town commissions. Um, we're going to start with an appointment to the Rainbow Commission. Um, Kim Goldsmith, um, if you wanna just step up to the microphone, welcome. Um, and we would just invite you to um, say a little bit about who you are, um, why you would like to be appointed to the Rainbow Commission, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, School Committee, for having me here this evening. Um, I decided I wanted to be part of the Rainbow Commission after having been an Arlington resident for now, I believe, about 14 years. And coming out in my position at AYCC and being rather supported being able to feel comfortable as somebody who identifies as non-binary and also having my child Lycia who is non-binary and is now a Gibbs middle schooler and my lovely partner Dan who's our only cisgender member of the family but incredibly supportive that this is my home and it is a place that's very important to me also as a counselor at AYCC a lot of the clients I work with are part of the LGBTQ plus community and it feels really important to take that service and care that I'm doing within the agency that much farther by being a voice for them. Thank you. Um, committee members want to say anything? Thank you for giving your time. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking on this position on our behalf in an effort to make this the most welcoming uh, and supportive community uh, in the Commonwealth. Thank you. You're welcome. If, Thank you. Well, I just want to, okay. I'm trying to, uh, I'm struggling to see the remote member. So if, if you're, so um, Mr. Thielman, Dr. Allison Ampey, and Ms. Morgan, if you would like to say anything, if you can use the raise hand feature just because it's hard to see um, your images otherwise. I'm good. I don't have anything to say. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Uh, periodically, yeah, would you, uh, through our administrative assistant, make an appointment to come back to the committee and just let uh, give us an update of what's going on. Of course, I would Since be you're happy our, to. you're our representative. Absolutely. Thank you. Should I do? At this time, I'd like to make a motion that the school committee approve Kim Goldsmith 
uh, appointment to the Rainbow Commission on behalf of the Arlington School Committee. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Any discussion? A roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Oh, we lost her. She, she nodded her head. She's nodding her head. Mr. Oh, Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, so that's, well, I got five. Five four. I didn't hear Ms. Okay. Morgan and uh, Mr. Carton is not here. Want to ask Ms. Did, we, did Jane drop off? Okay. okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Congratulations! You've been appointed to the Rainbow Commission. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Ready for the next? Uh, yes. So now. At this time, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Michael Bronstein to uh, as a reappointment to the Envision Arlington Commission and Scott Lever as a reappointment to the Envision Arlington Commission also. Second. Second. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman to reappoint uh, two members to the Envision Arlington Commission. Any discussion? A roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Anthe. Yes, and Ms. Morgan's in, in the attendees again. I didn't need to be promoted. She needs to be bumped up to a participant, I mean, to a uh, panelist. And I vote yes, so that's another 5-0. I don't know how to control her. She should be there. Yeah, it's not letting. She has to accept it. Here she goes. There she is. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry for all the technical glitches. <laughs> They're doing a great job. All right. <laughs> Public comment. Um, for members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. I will be the timer and will give the speaker a signal when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the per performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. Um, we have two people signed up for public comment tonight. Uh, the first is Rebecca Gaffey. Gaffey. Yes. Gaffey. So if you just want to step, oh, sure. sit up to the microphone so we can hear you and just um, if you can give us your name and address before sure. you start. Hi, um, thanks for having me. My name's Rebecca Gotti um, and I live at 3 Osborne Road. Um, and we moved here about a year ago and um, I currently have three students um, at Hardy Elementary School with a fourth that will be coming in a few years. Um, and, and overall, it's been a wonderful experience, and um, my kids are so happy to be here, and we're, we're very happy to be in a good school district. Um, we were homeschooling during the pandemic, so it's a big relief off me um, to have kids in school. Um, just like two things that, that they were struggling with a little bit was um, my daughter is in kindergarten, and her kindergarten class is 24 students. Um, and I think it's a little bit overwhelming for the, the kids and the teachers right now to have that many. So um, I think there had been some talk of maybe adding a fourth classroom, but I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Um, and it's not, you know, she's overall having a good experience, but it was something that was 
a little bit concerning to me because it felt like a lot of five-year-olds. Um, and, and the second thing I just wanted to address, my um, friend has been working on this issue, and, and she'll speak after me for um, many years, but um, my kids have been seeing that there isn't quite enough time to eat lunch at school. Um, they, uh, I guess between, they have 20 minutes, but between like waiting online, getting their food, sitting down, getting settled, that it, they end up kind of ending up throwing away their lunch because they're, they're not able to finish it. And I had wondered, because I was thinking about the logistics of getting six grades through the cafeteria, and, and you don't want to extend the period too long because you don't want kids eating at like nine in the morning, but um, I had heard from some parents that during the pandemic, kids had been eating in their classrooms, which then made it possible to have a more normal lunchtime, like noon, and have a little bit longer, like 30 minutes. Um, and I just wondered if it, that was something, um, we had spoken to the principal about it, and she said that we sh it was something we should just bring to you as something to, to discuss and um, you know, keep the discussion going. I, I under, I've only been in the school district a year, but I understand it's been a kind of ongoing discussion. Um, so that's it, but yeah, thank you for, for listening, and um, I really appreciate what you guys do. So. Thank you, and just so you understand, we don't typically respond to your comment right here, right now, but it might be something that comes up um, later or at another meeting, but thank you. Um, all right, our, another, um, <clears throat> our next um, public comment is Laura Saylor, who I believe is uh, on Zoom. I don't see her. Okay. Here. If she reaches out, she's welcome to speak at our uh, next. There is one um, telephone number here, but it doesn't, and it doesn't identify the person, so I can't do anything with it. And the raised hand is not. The raised hand is just Stephanie. Okay. Principal. Oh. Um, okay. So we will move on. Our next um, item on the agenda are student representatives. Welcome, both in person this evening. Um, we. All right, super. It's hard to see. <laughs> hard to see everybody. Uh, we would love to hear about what's been going on uh, at AHS recently. So welcome. Um, recently, I'd say she the, needs the mic. Oh. oh yeah, we got to slide the mic. Sorry. Thank you. So professional. Okay. Um, recently, I guess the biggest buzz around the school has been the PSATs and how those went, especially for the sophomores and juniors. Um, Obviously, nobody likes standardized testing, but I think it went really smoothly this year. I think the fact that there was only two classes at the end of the day afterwards was like a really, really good choice. Because if we had to go through a bunch of different classes that were really short, that wouldn't have been very uh, like well focused. Um, the fall sports teams have been doing an awesome job. I think soccer is like practically undefeated. Good for them. Uh, <laughs> know anything else? Uh, well, we did have our pep rally, and that went amazing. There was a lot of school spirit. It was really fun all around. And then, I don't know if I said it last time, but homecoming does have a date, and we've got that all sort of planned out. We're working on it, but it's November 18th, I believe. Yeah. So that'll be fun. The school, school spirit's doing amazing this year, and it's all really good. Thank you. Tamaki, did you want to add anything? Uh, not really. I think Amy and Mo covered it A little that. louder, that might. Uh, I think Amy and Mo covered it all. Thank you. All right. Next, um, a possible vote to approve the cafeteria workers contract for July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2025. Mr. Henry. The uh, reason the word possible was there, we weren't sure if the cafeteria uh, staff w had approved it uh, by this meeting. They have. Therefore, I move to approve the cafeteria workers contract and authorize the chair to sign for the school committee. Second. All right. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Schlickman to approve the cafeteria workers contract. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's six in favor. All right. Um, <clears throat> 
Next, we have the Pierce School Improvement Plan. So I'll turn this over to Dr. Homan to introduce the Pierce team. All right, well, the Pierce team makes their way up here. Um, I'll say a couple of words. Pierce and Dallin will be presenting their school improvement plans uh, this evening, and they are the first two school improvement plans for this school year. I think uh, I just want to commend these two groups because they have gotten things together quite quickly in a year where we're really trying to involve as many people on our school's new instructional leadership teams as possible in the development of these plans. And I know that Principal Amadi has some folks with him who will be helping to present. And welcome. Thank you for coming. I think these are two uh, fantastic school improvement plans that you're going to hear this year. And my hope is that you'll see <coughs> continuity across the work we're doing in schools and also focus on the specific work that needs to happen in school communities where um, those schools have unique challenges that they're trying to solve mm -hmm. and work on together. So I'm looking forward to these presentations. I'm very grateful for our team for being here. Uh, Mr. Amadi, you have a slide advancer right there that should work for you. And I'll turn it over to you. So funny first question, to move forward, is that the right button? That's the right side button. <laughs> okay. Let's see if it works. All right. Cool. There it goes. Yep. Hold on. <laughs> Where am I aiming at? You're at me. Okay. Aiming at me. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you um, uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, at school committee this evening. I'm joined by a team uh, behind me, so I'm going to introduce uh, members of our team, and then each member of the team uh, will share a brief part of tonight's presentation. These are members of our um, instructional leadership team and educators uh, at the Pierce Building. So I'd like to welcome Alicia Coletti, second grade teacher, Colleen Lloyd, kindergarten teacher, Laura Goldstein, ELL teacher, Sarah Huber, science coach, and Steph McKenna, math coach. Um, Alicia, you want to come up and share the agenda for the evening? Yeah. Come on up. I have my piece of paper I'm just going to read from. Mm -hmm. So tonight we will briefly um, discuss our school community, about the wins at our school, and about some of the challenges we face as a school. We will also share some um, important initiatives that our instructional leadership team has identified along with some actions that we plan to take, and we hope that you enjoy our presentation. Thank you, Alicia. Yep. Oops. This is... Um, not the right duck. This is not the one that we... The next slide should be uh, Introduction to Peers. That was the wrong year. At the right wrong year yeah what's it the file called Andrew um, should be in Novus here it is this one no looks right all right here we go okay so th the work that we've started this year and have continued from last year is really centered around the Arlington Public School vision statement and I've um, bolded the only line that I'll, I'll read, which is um, we're centering our work around all learners in our school need to feel, feel a sense of belonging and experience joy and growth, or growth and joy, as it's written, because it's really important academically um, and socially, social emotionally for all students. Um, I want to thank members of our instructional team because we've been working very hard over the course of the last six weeks to review data and craft this updated plan. I want to thank members of our school council who we, we've met with this year to revise um, and, and draft this plan. And I want to thank our um, PTO uh, for their generous support of all teachers, families, and children, and make a plug for our Fall Fest, which is on October 29th at 2 p.m. at the Pierce Building, for any members of uh, this team that would like to be there. Steph? We're going to share our wins first. So I get the easy job of talking about a win. So last year, many of our ACE cycles were focused on student voice and discourse during math discussions. Often we spent time discussing strategies teachers might want to try to increase engagement in these discussions, particularly with students who might not always feel comfortable sharing their ideas. It felt important to provide opportunities for teachers to observe each other in this work, so we spent some of our ACE time in another grade level during math. 
Teachers were able to record teacher moves they noticed and strategies they wanted to discuss and try in their own classrooms. And just this week, one of our wonderful second grade teachers shared with me, with me that she started incorporating something that she observed last year in a fifth grade class and how much of an impact it's made in her discussions. Thank you. Sarah? All right. Um, so last year, Pierce, uh, in general, demonstrated strong performance in science. You can see the stats. 78% of grade five students at Pierce met or exceeded state standards compared to 69% of the, of the district and 43% of the state. Um, I, I'm the science coach for the district, but one thing I notice at Pierce is that across the board from grades K to five, the teachers teach science and they teach it with fidelity and with enthusiasm. And I think this conveys to, the, to student learning so that even though MCAS is only given to fifth grade, it's indicative of all the science learning that goes on throughout all the years at Pierce. It just builds on itself. Thank you. Colleen? The next slide. Come on, work for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Last year, we focused on improving student-teacher relationships. We set up informal mentors, which we did by asking all faculty to create new relationships with students outside of their classroom. So that it was someone that you didn't already know, you didn't have a relationship with, and teachers uh, nominated students that they thought would benefit from just a, another check-in, another trusted adult in, in the building, just to deepen their sense of belonging within the school community. So when teacher, teachers intentionally got to know students and they got to know a little bit about their lives, interests, and school experience, teachers prioritized saying hello to students, chatting briefly with the children in the halls during less structured time. We believe that this, in part, allowed students to build trust with more teachers in the building. Dr. Holman, would you mind? Thank you. I'm doing it, yeah. Thanks. Um, I think there's one more win slide. Thank you. All right, so there's a lot happening on this slide. So one of the things I want to share as an additional win is that we've, we've started um, some more informal uh, groups, and it's similar to what uh, Ms. Lloyd just shared. Um, we started having more lunch groups, uh, particularly with, with our fifth graders, to get a better understanding of what their life is like at Pierce, to understand what they enjoy about school, what is challenging uh, to them. And I want to share a few quotes. Um, these are student, fifth grade students that, that I've met with this year. One shared that math is my favorite subject. It is hard for me, but my teacher helps me. She believes in me and encourages me. She reminds me that when I do not know how to solve problems um, and, and tells me that which makes me work hard. Another student shared, I enjoy social studies because the questions are interesting and make me think. And I share these tonight because these are a testament, testament to what our children are saying within our schools. They highlight what they're really thinking. And this is part of our action uh, moving forward this year to incorporate more student uh, opportunities to chat with, with educators informally. The last one I'll share this evening is, uh, centers around two-way uh, communication with our families. 85% of families have responded favorably to communication from both the home and the school. I'm just going to angle this way a little bit. And what the, these, are, these are measures around how, how comfortable and confident they are um, talking with their, with their teachers, with administrators, with, res, with, with getting uh, kind of robust feedback uh, on how their children are doing. And we see that 85% number as a, as a win. We also face some challenges. And, and the first one um, is perhaps our, our biggest challenge, I think, as a school, as a district. And, and I could go on as a state and as a, as a nation. Um, too many students are out of school uh, for various reasons. So at Pierce last year, 11.8% of students uh, missed 18 or more days of school. For our African American and black students, that number was 25%, which mirrors Arlington Public Schools. And for students in the high needs category, uh, that number was 20%. These are 20% of a, a large subgroup of our students that are missing more than 18 days of school. And I share that this evening um, because I think at the most fundamental level, students really are not going to learn what we expect them to learn if they are not in our school. And so we are prioritizing uh, this challenge 
and taking it on in a number of ways to make sure that we are getting our students that are healthy uh, and, and able to learn in our doors as frequently as we can. We have some remaining concerns around uh, reading literacy achievement, particularly around phonics uh, work at the, at the youngest grades, particularly kindergarten, um, and, and of course as they move through first through third grade. And we have some more nuanced um, concerns around reading comprehension in the upper grades, notably around nonfiction texts. And um, it, when I move through later on, I'll share some of the ways we're going to explore and try to tackle this challenge. And lastly, while we know that we have um, some real growth, student growth in, in math, we also know that our achievement is not where we hope uh, for it to be. And this is on the MCAS. 52% um, of our children are meeting or exceeding uh, state standards. And we don't think that really um, matches what we see in the classroom right now. Uh, and so we're going to take a, a deeper dive to figure out kind of what we can do to improve that and to make sure that all of our students um, are, are uh, mastering the standards of the grade levels. And I made a mistake, and I spoke for Laura Goldstein. And I'm very sorry about that. Laura, would you, would you please come up? And I'm so sorry um, about that. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit more um, specifics in regards to the high-need students that we mentioned and chronic absenteeism. One portion of the high-needs groups are EL students. And the number of EL students is increasing at Pierce. I now have 34 um, students as active. Um, ELs and their absence can exacerbate learning gaps because they need targeted language instruction and grade level learning opportunities. Um, I feel that students feel more isolated and less connected to school um, when they're absent. And right now teachers and administrators are following up as best as we can to support families and the range of need is significant. To improve this we are meeting more frequently with families that have been chronically absent and we feel that additional support from APS could benefit us. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of the priorities this evening. One is to continue to build a more cohesive response to chronic absenteeism. Uh, this is the work of our teachers, our administrators, our, our central office, and our family partnerships. We are going to continue to um, um, try to build a sense of belonging for our students, and there are a number of ways that we're going to continue to try to do that. Um, continue with student focus groups in, in multiple grades. Some uh, informal mentoring, which we are going to revise based on what we did last year. And trying to model for our students what it, what it means to have growth and joy, um, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom, too. We believe in those pillars. Next slide, please. And lastly, I just want to share some of our overarching goals, um, and I won't read from the script. We want to um, engage all of our staff, students, uh, and families in cultur culturally responsive practices. We want to provide students with opportunities to deeply engage with grade aligned materials uh, every day in all content areas. And we want to focus on best practices, uh, particularly around using high quality universal screeners uh, in the area of literacy to ensure that our students are getting what they need to learn how to read. And some of the resources we've touched on this evening, but um, I want to call attention to just a few. Um, we're thinking a lot about our language learners and, and considering um, how we can best serve them. Um, we are working through our literacy uh, core team, which I'm a member of, to, to think about um, our literacy resources and how to best serve children moving forward. Um, and we are going to center school-wide professional development around student discourse and student engagement strategies. And that's what I have for you this evening. And thank you to the team, uh, um, our Pierce team. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Hainer. First off, thank you all for taking the time and excellent presentation. Quick question, is there anything that's consistent uh, that you could, with the absenteeism that, uh, that's similar? with the students or is it across the board? So there are, there, are, there are a number of things. I mean, I could probably talk about three. So one is COVID. 
um, it, which last year we know impacted um, many of our students. It impacted families and it uh, adversely Im impacted um, children that lived with multiple family members. Uh, at the beginning of the year, students were staying home as contacts. So, so there is a technical piece to that. We have students um, where transportation can be uh, an issue, particularly in the winter. Uh, there appears to be some trend data that transportation can be challenging, especially um, with folks that are working in different places and or living further away from the school. And then I, I do think that there is an area to address um, in some of the older grades too is um, working with our families to make sure that when they're taking off school days for whatever they need to as a family, that we're doing that strategically so that our children are in school. And those are kind of, I think, the three um, areas I would highlight, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Mr. Sleckman. Okay, uh, thank you for the excellent report. One thing I thought was heartening is when you mentioned that you were seeing a disparity between fiction and nonfiction. And when I saw your gender gap in terms of growth and literacy, that was the first thing in my mind was there a disparity in terms of teaching fiction and nonfiction. And when I have all the raw data, which is what I used to do for a living, I, I, that was one of the first things I checked was disparities on that, that, on that access. And I says, I'm glad to, to see that you're, you're looking at that. that. That's really an important thing that a lot of schools tend to miss. Um, I'm very, very impressed with your growth scores overall. Uh, you can't control what a kid knows when they walk in the door on the first day of school but you have ultimate control over how much they grow over the 180 days you have them over the school year. And so the big marker that's important is your growth numbers, and your growth numbers are outstanding with the exception of your high needs cohort, and I know that you've looked at that and you're looking at that, I appreciate that. Um, the other thing is in terms of gender, again, you've got a huge gender gap in growth in terms of mathematics, which is the opposite of your ELA problem. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about why your female students are not growing at the rate your male students are? In mathematics? In mathematics. Yes, Mr. Hanner. So it's, it's a good question and one that we have thought of. Um, I mean, I could hypothesize. I think one of the things that um, we know um, is that in area of mathematics, oftentimes, as a generalization, boys tend to um, share strategies and or be more um, comfortable in some of the uh, discussions, both whole group um, and, and in small groups. Um, and so I think thinking about ways to be inclusive around discussion strategies, around engagement strategies that make sure that um, every child um, of, of all genders has an opportunity to take part in those discussions that are student to student. Um, if we can keep doing that and learn new ways to do that, I think there is a through way to improve some of the, the metrics that you're seeing this evening. Yeah, the answers in the district was the district scores don't show that, mm -hmm. that split. So I, I appreciate being aware of that and think, in collaborating with your colleagues who might have an idea of what to look for as well. Thank you very much. This is an excellent uh, uh, school improvement plan, and I'm very happy to, to receive it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I enjoyed hearing about your schools and was impressed at the increase in, what was it? Sorry, I'm looking back at your slides on my computer. Um, the student-teacher relationships between fall and spring, that was really impressive. Um, but one question I had when you were discussing, you mentioned that you we're hoping for additional support from APS regarding the chronic absenteeism, but I'm not sure I understood what specifically it is that you're hoping APS can give you or will do or, or what. Thank you. Would you like me to kind of share a bit what I think? There are some students that are chronically absent that have a lot of things working against them. And it may be transportation, 
it may be um, not having access to the same resources other other people uh, that live around here. It may be uh, not knowing uh, much English right now, and I could go on. I think that there is a, a, a portion of our uh, student body and their families that right now, um, the way we're addressing it is by me calling or Ms. Goldstein calling and trying to get translators, bringing folks into the building when we can. And I would say from the, from the human side, um, we, we are doing, I think, close to all that we can. And I often wonder, what are the additional resources that we could have available to us? Could we have people go to houses? Could we have a centralized uh, way uh, for families to be able to walk in somewhere off-site that we're closer to their home? Could we have a, a, a um, perhaps a rotating group of people that would make house visits if necessary to be able to assist families around whether it's chronic absenteeism or, or any other area? And so I think, um, Dr. Allison Ampey, that, that's kind of what I'm alluding to, that perhaps there is something that bigger than we can do than, than just one school um, to address some of these issues. Thank you. That's very interesting and um, a good thing to think about. I see Jane's picture. I don't know if Mr. Thielman is even still with us. Ms. Morgan, did you want to say anything? Okay. If you do, just jump in. Um, <clears throat> Just, just, so Dr. Allison B sort of asked and commented on some of the things I was thinking about, but one of the things that um, your comments brought to mind was I know that um, when we were thinking about sort of what options we um, had with the ESSER funds, one of them was some kind of sort of central outreach, EL, um, some community sort of hub. Is that sort of what... That's a little bit of what you're describing, is that? If I just jump in yeah. for a second. Come in, Laura. Uh, I, I, I know you need, you need to come up have to, to come the to the mic, mic though, yeah, yeah. I've worked in other, I mean, I've been here a very, very, very long time, but when I worked in another district, we had a community outreach um, center. So they met the families that came in. Um, they had ways that they, they could identify what the needs were that those students um, had. We sometimes get students and we don't, they're not even in, this, in the right grade because there's a miscommunication because they don't speak English. Um, so I think if we had a center, we had a bigger group working with these families. If we showed we cared in Arlington about these families and we say that we do, it would be a district coming together, not just Mm -hmm. um, Andrew and I and the classroom teacher like ch chasing down the parents and trying to work on these things and trying to get them food and trying to get that there'd be a bigger mm -hmm. resource that would address the needs of the families that live here in Arlington and that means Thompson and I know that they have a more centralized piece but um, I think if we had that for all of us and we work together on it, we could pull from the, the greatest resources, the greatest minds here to, to work together to support these families. Thank yeah. you, that's helpful. Welcome, Mr. Thielman. I was on the call, I listened. Okay. No, Chris did a great know. job, Laura always does a great <laughs> job, so I listen. Yeah. You wanna add anything? No, I can't, I can't add anything. Okay. Yes, Dr. Um, Helmut. So I just wanna add to the conversation we're having now that um, I know, I'm glad Mr. Thielman is here because he's on this uh, strategic planning priority for group That's right. and one of the conversations they've been having is about a uh, welcome center and having these resources somewhat centralized and having central resources that we can deploy when we know that we have a situation at a particular school uh, where a family might need some additional support or be, to be hooked into some resources that would help them uh, get their students to school and I also think that messaging together all of the schools around the importance of being at school for mental health and for students development um, is something that we all are thinking about a lot and want to work on together now that we've dug into this uh, these data so thank you no I think that's helpful and I think it's important for us to hear um, how it's what, what it looks like in the school so that we can think mm -hmm. about it from the from a bigger picture um, Tamaki did you have your hand Yeah, so uh, for the uh, African-American slash... It's, it's tricky to hear you. I don't know if you're, where you're... Because uh, I very much want to yeah, hear... I'll, uh, I'll get closer. Um, 
for the African American slash Black section of the frequent absentees table, uh, is that including MECO students? Or? I'm sorry, I just similar to other districts, Tamaki. Say the question again. Oh, uh, for the uh, African American slash Black wait, section. Wait, 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 hold on. Don't. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Oh boy. Okay, try again. Okay. So uh, for the African American slash Black section of the frequent absentees table, is that uh, including Metco students? Met Metco? Yes. Oh, students in the Metco program. Yes, yes. it is. I, I just want to say that when I was a principal, we had these issues with fam supporting families and I had a social worker in a 500 student school who was just full time on all of this. So I, I, I see the need and I hope that we, if I hear this theme coming from other schools, that we uh, view this as a systemic uh, question that we should be addressing because that, that's really critical. I mean, we're, we're not a home community if we don't make sure we're home for everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to share this evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank all you, very Mr. much. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, next, we have the um, Dallin School Improvement Plan. Dr. Holman. Yes. So my first question for you, Mr. Dingman, will be, are these the right slides? <laughs> 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 I'm going to flip through them really quickly. Yes. OK, great. <laughs> yes, at least the first two. I am happy to steer for you if you just give me the signal because I'm not sure that's got it getting a signal all the way across. Um, thank you to the Pierce team and I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Dingman, to share the Down School Improvement Plan. Yeah, I feel kind of lonely up here, <laughs> Andrew. Um, and um, my, uh, my, my co-admin, my support network, the wonderful assistant principal, uh, Samantha Carustis, planned to be here tonight. but. Um, some family responsibilities called, so I'm, I'm here on my own. I'm going to do my best. There's one goal area that she's uh, very tuned into and is leading, so I'm a little disappointed. Um, that's our goal for, but I'm going to do my best to, to talk through it. Um, and I guess I want to start something I've been thinking about. Um, this is my starting my ninth year uh, at Dallin Elementary, and um, when I think about uh, you know, all of you and um, being in this district and knowing you for, you know, I get to come here every now and then, um, and the importance of sustained leadership. And I think back on um, uh, the people that I've worked with, and I, I really feel grateful to be uh, an administrator in this district and do this work. And I think it's pretty special that um, our administration has been in place uh, in a lot of cases for as long as they have. And I think that's the reason why um, we'll look at some wins, um, why we're having success and why we've overcome some pretty uh, uh, impressive challenges um, as a community. So happy to be here with everybody tonight. Um, you want me to try it? So I, I, you know, tonight I want, to, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Dallin, our wins and challenges, which will be thread in uh, to our priorities that we will be looking at for this year. Uh, I'll talk to you about our key initiatives, some action steps. Um, and some, some things that are important to our school. If we're competing with this, it's never going to work. Um, so here we are down in a learning community. Um, one of the things that, uh, of note for us, which, um, you know, is, is what it is, is we're a school that has decreased our enrollment just a smidge since um, some of the heights of our enrollment challenges. We're 425 students. Um, several years ago at our height, we were upwards of 500. So we've, we've uh, come down, we're, we've decreased a little bit in our class um, sizes and in our amount of staff, but we're still a big, um, beautiful and active school of 22 sections. And um, we also are privileged to support the Supported Learning Center, uh, one of four in our district um, for K2 and three through five students. Um, we have a very active PTO, uh, we have an active school council, and we have an emerging active dig in our communities, all play an important role uh, in our school. Um, at Dallin, our school culture and our climate are always priorities. Uh, we 
uh, capture some of that work through our three core values of courage, respect, and responsibility. And um, feel free to quiz any down student on the street if you see them on those core values, just to make sure I'm not blowing smoke. You might have to take that list. You did take it, didn't you? I didn't touch it. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, of the many things that I'm proud of in my time there is, is supporting our community um, and the families in our community uh, in keeping diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, as a priority um, that began early uh, in my tenure, so around 2016, 2017. Um, we, I also feel really uh, encouraged by the work that we've done with our grade level teams around our what we call our ACE blocks, which is our time with teachers. The uh, ability to, to grow our teams, um, the ability to collaborate across um, not just teachers, but coaches and specialists. Dallin has always been a school where folks move grade levels. So uh, reforming teams every year has to be a priority. Um, so that time you know, has been pretty precious for us because each year, usually the folks around a table are a little bit different. And so we need that time um, because when we're at our best as a teaching team, we're our best for our students. Um, we, uh, and I'll talk about this tonight, we'll continue our strong commitment to early literacy and ensuring that our students in K through three are equipped with the early reading skills that they need for future success because literacy is equity. Um, mathematics uh, is another area of practice that uh, I, will, I will spend a little bit time talking about. You know, uh, we, uh, we're, we're proud of the work that we do in our classrooms and we see opportunities that we want to build on to ensure that all students are learning and benefiting from the curriculum. I have one part I am going to read. So at the start of our year this year, Down staff reflected on Arlington's new vision statement. The words belonging, growth, joy, and empower resonated with our educator team after a two-year stretch where our ability to connect authentically with one another has been greatly compromised due to a pandemic. So now in this new phase, uh, we're beginning our year thinking about ways to heal relationships, amplify connections, and design new systems or redesign systems to increase our community's sense of belonging. The, so the question that we're asking, and we have asked and talked about, what do you want to heal? What do you want to amplify? What do you want to design? At Dallin, we are focusing in four different areas for goals this year, two instructional objectives, an equity and school culture objective, and we have an operations objective that's important to our school. Um, in a moment, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about each. But as a high-level overview, we'll continue our focus on K through three literacy, ensuring that our students are benefiting from systematic, sequential, early reading strategy development. We want our kids to have all the skills to be confident readers moving forward in their curriculum experience and across uh, the K through five time at Dallin Elementary. This year, we are working a little bit more closely on our progress monitoring. Um, progress monitoring allows for our groups that work in the classroom, our teachers who work outside the classroom to ensure that students are getting what they need in a timely way. We wanna look at the effectiveness of intervention and ensure that our groups are flexible so that students that need support are getting support when they need it, and when students are ready to return confidently in the classroom, we're making space um, for new friends um, or, or setting those students off to be successful with confidence from the adult team. Uh, our second objective, or instructional objectives in mathematics. Uh, I'll talk more about what compels this goal, um, but what we notice is that not all students are benefiting from the instruction, and our goal is to continue to implement strategies that ensures that we have all inclusive environments for mathematics. From a school culture uh, lens, our objective, like other schools, is on belonging. Um, we want to ensure that in this uh, post-pandemic, uh, or at least post-restriction uh, time in our schools, that we are refocusing our energy on the quality of relationships with our students, with our teachers, uh, and with our families. Uh, and again, I'll speak more to that in just a moment. And then Dallin uh, Elementary has had a persistent arrival and dismissal safety challenge. And so we've been working collaboratively with our town government uh, and different groups within the town government to change some of the ways that our students arrive and leave school because our safety, safety is an important part of what we do every day. So 
So looking at some of our wins and um, speaking more to some of our priorities, uh, last year I talked a little bit about a cohort of kindergartners that we began to pay attention to in 2019. Uh, our school at that time had uh, been piloting new assessment tools, normed assessment tools, um, known as DIBBLES. Uh, since that time, we have universally used those tools uh, across all of our elementary schools in the district. We have also brought in uh, very important curriculum resources, and we train often our teachers professional learning to bring those into their readers workshop. So in 2019, in the fall, we saw a um, concerning statistic that 50, only 56% of our kindergartners were leaving kindergarten with uh, um, uh, benchmark phonemic awareness skills. Phonemic awareness is a uh, very important indicator of future reading success. Since that time, they've been through a pandemic, but they have benefited from new ways of instruction that are more aligned with early reading science. So looking now at last year's, the same group in the fall of third grade, looking at a composite score that inclu includes their oral reading fluency, their accuracy, their ability to decode words, and their comprehension. 96% of our students are at benchmark in their composite score. So we are now sending 96% of that group on to fourth grade with the tools that they need to be successful readers. And this is the result of uh, great work by our teachers, great work by um, our directors and coaches, and obviously great work from our students. So we feel uh, incredibly encouraged by this story just looking a little bit uh, closer at some of the discrete skills um, and doing sort of uh, a, taking a different type of a look, looking just across like a, from a curriculum focus. So again, that, that group of um, kindergartners back in 2019, looking at their phoneme segmentation and their nonsense word fluency, you can see that a little under 60% of those kids were at benchmark. But with new curriculum tools, our kindergartners now um, almost have 74% uh, um, in 2022, and 85% of our kindergartners left with benchmark nonsense word fluency, which is a decoding skill that is critical to future reading success. So um, just well done all around. It's exciting to see. It's exciting to be in classrooms. Um, you know, we've shared some of this work, you know, uh, with our CPAC too, because it really is students who have more fragile um, learning profiles that we want to do our best work for. So we're going to keep going. We have, we have this hunch that it's working. Um, and, you know, from just a, on the ground level, our teachers are really excited and our students are, are, are doing wonderful things. In mathematics, we started last year um, working towards the goal of creating equitable and inclusive mathematics environments. Um, just a quick... Well, I'll, I'll save this story. Uh, our action steps you can see in our school improvement plan really focus on using culturally responsive strategies of instruction, specifically to academic discourse, teaching kids st uh, specific skills for speaking uh, in class, and um, also ensuring that our students are engaged in productive struggle so that the mathematic challenges that all of our students receive are, that all of our students are receiving a mathematical challenge. Um, so if we were to look at aggregates and if we were to look at comparisons, we see some encouraging statistics, right? When we look at high-level MCAS and things like that. But when we look at disaggregated data and we look at the experience of students who are falling into that high-needs category, there's a different story that's unfolding for them and a persistent gap that continues. And it's our gap, and it's our school systems gap. I included a little bit of data on what it looks like for three through eight in APS. This summer in one of the retreats, I was talking with a high school teacher. Um, he teaches both in the A track and in the honors track. And I asked him, what do you notice is the difference between students in those tracks? And he said, I notice in my A-Track, students don't have the confidence to talk as learners. They don't have the same degree of academic uh, discourse, quote unquote. Uh, and that's just an on-the-fly question. And you see it in mathematics classes across the district. Um, these are percentages, but these are students. And they aren't, these numbers aren't high enough that we don't know who they are. Um, so this will 
com, uh, con, we will continue our work. It's great partnership. We have a wonderful math coach at our building um, who's connected with other wonderful math coaches across the district. You heard a little bit from Pierce um, on a, in a similar way about a similar goal um, because the curriculum and the way that we teach mathematics, students sharing their ideas in math class is an important part of their experience. Our equity goal centers around our sense of belonging and our students' sense of belonging. And I'm going to go off script here. You have this, you have this data in front of you, but um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this: our families, 95% of our families, on uh, our surveys that we administered, say they believe that their teachers respect their students. 95%. 94% of students say that my teacher respects me. But when you ask students questions about belonging, I feel seen, people care about me if I came in sad, those statistics drop to about 60% or under 60%. That same data is replicated in our staff data. Less than 60% of our staff say that they feel, they, they, they do not feel connected to other staff members in their building. However, they will say to 90 plus percent certainty that they would recommend working there <laughs> to their friends. So there are intentional things that we need to be doing to ensure that our students not only feel like they're respected, but they feel like they belong. Um, and uh, one example of that is we're starting off our year challenging everybody to learn as many names in the building as you can. And I'll tell you what, nothing lights a student up more than knowing their name when they walk in the building. Um, but we also, in, uh, in, our, in our work this year, we're gonna purposefully engage staff across the school, K through five, with leadership opportunities uh, also creating more opportunities for affinity groups, which have been successful for our students, um, and designing family engagement purposefully with the goal of connection. Um, it started with our, our curriculum night open house, and it's continuing with activities planned with our PTO across the year that brings low stakes interaction as a priority for um, our community. Another important goal for our school is the development of our instructional leadership team. And so you're meeting members of other schools' instructional leadership teams. I hope you hear a lot about instructional leadership teams on this um, re-entry into, um, or this idea, excuse me, of healing and amplifying and designing. We wanna design, instructional, design an instructional leadership team of educators who feel very connected um, to the work, talking about the actual practice that happens in their classroom. Um, so we are a very much, this is an example of where we are in close alignment at, with the Arlington Public School System with Dr. Homan and Dr. McNeil's vision for instructional leadership. We have uh, a wonderful group of teachers and specialists, special educators, coaches, and directors working together. Um, we've started our year creating a vision for quality instruction and uh, learning um, that represents the belief system of our school. And we're going to continue working on indicators that guide that work and also um, bring our students into that work too to get their feedback. So we have um, that's also mapped out in our school improvement plan and is an important priority for this year. You want the assist? Yeah, you can do that one. Yeah, thank you. So just a, a, a high level overview of some of our initiatives and action steps. Um, uh, where we intend to focus, spend our energy. You know, it's not. It, probably, it will not capture everything that we do in a school year, but it'll, it'll, uh, this focuses on some of the things that we we're putting the most energy in. Um, and I'm uh, a little bummed that uh, Sam couldn't be here tonight, our assistant principal, but she's done some wonderful work with the um, select board and the uh, TAC in um, uh, formalizing some important traffic changes at our school, uh, which we continue to build on. We're working with uh, the DPW um, to update signs. Uh, we're looking at um, some bigger aspirations this year in terms of grants that will help fund um, uh, some of the recommendations we have about sidewalk additions, painting, and, and other things um, that we would be happy to talk more about at a future date if, if the school committee would like. It's just in its, we're in our kind of second phase of that work. Thank you everyone for, for your time um, and love to answer some questions. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, your colleague was talking about 
challenges with the attendance and making family connections. Is that a theme that you're experiencing too, or mm. is your population different enough that your your challenges are different? Yeah, I, I you know um, even though we're under a mile away, I think you know Andrew um, and the Pierce School have some challenges that are unique to Pierce. We certainly have some stories. Um, I think f last year uh, in in prior years we um, dealt more with uh, school refusal and school anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I don't think that those numbers, though, are at a, at a you know yeah. frequency that you know match some of those challenges. Got more single family homes and uh, homeowners. Yeah, uh, and transportation is a, a bit less of an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Fair question, though. Uh, thank you. I thought this was a thoughtful presentation, and it appears your school is moving forward. Uh, your disconnect among the teachers, is this sort of like the fifth grade teachers don't talk to the kindergarten teachers that much, one of those kind of deals? You know, um, we spent our first day doing a lot of connection work, and um, and then we talked about this with our instructional leadership team, and the, somebody said this, you know, there were teachers that were hired during the pandemic and I never got to know him. Mm -hmm. And even if, even if we were there together, there was this sense that we weren't, it was a sense that we had to be so careful. Um, and we did, you know, we did need to be careful. And so, um, all that came, you know, came out, right. All that, this is still with us and we just, we need to put it in front of us and make time for each other, which we've been doing a lot of. Yeah. Well, that's a challenge of having new people come in during the Zoom. Oh yeah. Zoom world, yeah. And if you, you know, just one last thing I'll say about it is, you know, it, it is connected to the idea of we want to retain and recruit mm -hmm. BIPOC educators. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to make space to ensure that belonging is a priority for, mm -hmm. for folks. So that's how, that's one of the ways that we'll make progress there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Morgan, um, can you help me understand a little bit, like we're seeing a lot of the culture and climate data in these SIPs, which I think is appropriate, and I appreciate it. I, I'm trying to sort of understand, so at each school, are the students and the staff and the families asked the same questions? Okay, so ish? Ish, yeah. Okay. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Meaning like belonging may be a, a through line in, in all the surveys, but other categories might not. So, so you picked were these you picked the questions that were reported here, or are there the, more yes. questions? I, so I these are these what are I'm a, trying to understand is so why these ones? I mean, for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. right? But why these ones as compared to some of the ones we saw from Pierce, and then why for some do we have the fall results, and some we have the spring? Is it because those the ones we just have the fall there wasn't much change to the spring or like I, I just like mm -hmm. I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to read between the lines like is there something here that we're not seeing or that I'm just not that I'm missing like so because I would expect that I, I would hope that a sense of belonging those that might increase over the course of the year mm -hmm. like right yep. so I, I guess I'm just curious why why these ones um, and and why report it this way? Yeah. Dr. Hellman. So I'm going to take this because of process. Oh, come on. I was ready. Panorama. You were ready. You, you go for it. Let me then, can you, and then build. Yeah, please. Okay. So I think these give a taste of some of the, some of the uh, groups of questioning that focus more on the quality of connection and belonging that students experience, that staff experience, and that families are experiencing. There's certainly not all the questions. Um, so that, that's part of it. Um, to, to hit the hit the point home, I think maybe a little bit, um, and um, secondly, the, to the second part of the question, we haven't had the um, we haven't. This isn't uh, surveys and student sur family surveys, student surveys and staff surveys are still new to our system, and so the amount of participation has fluctuated. So. Um, I would anticipate, so these, these sort of are a baseline for us. This year we come back to these surveys in the fall and in the spring, having had the experience of doing them last year. But for example, our students, um, 200 plus students responded in the fall of 2021, but we had dramatically less 
in the spring of 2022. So to make the comparison would be a little disingenuous because they looked pretty good when you had 85 kids respond. But um, I, I don't think it's, we're, I don't think we're ready to move past those, uh, these particular outcomes yet. I think we want to pay attention to them. And I will add that process wise last fall, we did a comprehensive survey with the whole community and got participation that's usable as a benchmark. Um, and it was a completely different survey than the one we had done in 2020. So we've changed the questions. So comparison from 2020 fall to 2021 fall isn't really possible because a lot of the categories and questions changed. Sure. And then in the spring, we wanted to do another round. And then last year, we had several more waves of COVID that sort of got in the way of some of the things. And we didn't want to press too hard on doing another full round, which is why the spring yeah. results have some varied participation rates. Some schools prioritized doing that in the spring. Um, I think the focus, one of the things we did at leadership workshop was really hone in on what is the panorama data telling you? And here's some time for you to really dig into it and pull out those things that are standing out to you. And so different schools had different things that they said, well, here's a disparity that we're really noticing and we're gonna let that drive our problem of practice and therefore what we do with the school improvement plan. So you may notice that different trends emerge for different schools and it's because of the data work that they did during leadership workshop and they're pulling out trends that are compelling to them and then building action steps around those when we do another round this fall it's going to be the same survey that we did last fall so noticing a trend from last fall to this fall should be much easier to do okay yeah i just want to make sure we're using good stuff yes if if it's not good stuff then we're kind of still chasing ghosts right so well, i'll just say conversely we did have um we did have a lot of families that um, completed the survey in the spring, so was able to share some of that data. Great, thank you. Sure. Mr. Cardin. Uh, so on the, on the literacy intervention, um, I know the district is looking at a new program, a new complete program. Can you share a little bit more about what intervention you used at yeah. Allen that was, seems to have been so successful? Yeah, so um, it's a combination of things. We work closely with coaches. Um, we also have worked with um, an outside group called Crafting Minds. Um, so they've done, they do consulting with our district. Um, the um, Dr. Melissa Orkin, who works with that organization, has done some work with the state. Uh, we continued work with their consultancy group last year in first grade, second grade, third grade, and somewhat in kindergarten um, and uh, throughout the year. And the focus was on uh, something called a structured literacy routine. So a discrete lesson plan and delivery uh, it's a pedagogy for ensuring that students in a 20 to 30 minute small group um, format receive phonemic, in, phonemic awareness instruction, phonics, um, decoding, letter ID, letter naming, depending on the grade, and some um, uh, fluency and automaticity work too. So yeah, really working on at, at the lesson level. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Carton kind of asked the question that I wanted to follow up on. Uh, just, it's really more of a comment. Um, I hope Dr. Holman that their success can be transmitted to other schools that might be interested. Um, I think the literacy work that they've been doing is really intriguing and, and great, uh, the results. So that's all. Thank you. Mr. Salmon. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Thanks very much for the presentation. As always, it's always really sure. good. Um, on the safety issue you're working on, what, what, where does that stand and what do you, if you just give us an update on that? Mm -hmm. um, so in the spring, we implemented our pilot. Uh, and uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, essentially we're shutting down uh, through traffic in front of the school every day, right. rerouting traffic through the neighborhood. Um, so uh, we had a really successful spring. We had a great weather spring. I'll say that too, just to be fair. Um, and we've had a great launch. We're, we just did our first walk to school and we, um, uh, I, actually I wanna crunch the numbers before I start throwing them around, but I will say they were high, right? The amount of families that were noticing walking to school, which is what this is really about in a community school, you're walking to school, um, is significantly up. Um, so in the, this latest phase is we are looking for new crosswalk additions. 
We're making the recommendation for another crossing guard with the amount of traffic that we have, which does have a, um, you know, is a budgetary conversation. So we understand that may be an aspiration that's unmet. But we're looking for new um, crosswalks. We're looking for an extension of sidewalk. We're looking for some new painting to it, the streets haven't been painted or repainted. Um, uh, no parking areas and signage replaced in a long time. Um, so that's, you know, we last see our last move was we had uh, DPW and APD out to do a walkthrough of everything. Um, Officer Rateau has been our liaison. He's been great. Um, we had signage changes, and now we're working on probably what is the more complicated stuff, which is getting some street painting and um, the addition of a crosswalk. Got it. Michael's not here. Oh, uh, Michael's not He's here. He's on uh, Zoom. Oh, he's on Zoom. So, Michael, is this, is this coming up with capital planning or not really? He looked like he was in transit. So, oh, here he is. Oh, that's all right. Um, no, it, this, this has not come up in capital planning. Okay. I just yeah, so, so far. Exclusively. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. For approvals. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo some of the comments about the literacy, the, <clears throat> the, that um, slide was very impressive and very exciting. And um, so, yeah, I would just echo, I don't, I think it was Dr. Allison Ampi about wh what, what you can do and your school can do to share that, um, that success and that expertise across the district. Yeah. It's, it's commendable. Thanks. Ampl give it to the teachers. They're, they've been awesome. They're really dedicated. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. For being Thank here. you. I got everybody in person. How about that? <laughs> Take care. Thanks, sir. Take care. All right. Now we have Dr. McNeil and our 2022 MCAS and accountability report. Oh, oh, okay. So this is Dr. Holman is also has some slides in here. So we did expand it beyond just the MCAS results. So we have some other data that we're going to talk about. Um, that includes panorama data, absenteeism data, and some from some different data sources. Let me see if this works. It's over here. Perfect. So the purposes for this, well, here's the agenda for what we're going to cover in this slide deck. We'll look at the purpose, vision, and mission. Some of the wins we have uh, noticed from the outcomes from the MCAS results, some of the challenges that were highlighted by the data, and some of the next steps that we'd like to put in place in order to address those challenges or continue to get the wins that we saw. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. So again, we're gonna talk about areas of success and areas where we wanna see a growth for Arlington Public Schools across uh, various outcome um, areas using multiple measures. Like I said, we have different um, metrics that we're going to highlight. And we're going to look at um, areas where we've had success and shown a commitment to equity, areas where we can continue to adjust our prop patterns of practice <coughs> uh, to achieve our shared mission and steps that we'll take this year and beyond to address our areas of challenge and growth. So again, looking at our vision statement, um, I think that this is a very powerful representation of things that we're trying to achieve, our horizon, what we are striving to be, so it's very aspirational. And again, looking at the bolded language, uh, we definitely want to achieve uh, to be an ed equitable educational community and then we, we have highlighted, as, you, as you've seen in the um, previous uh, school improvement plan presentations, a sense of belonging, which is actually a theme that we've adopted for this year. And looking at where we can see, provide uh, experiences of growth and joy. And we want to empower our students to use the knowledge that they achieve in the classroom to shape their own futures and contribute to a better world. So that's what we're looking at. That's our vision statement. And then this is our mission statement. This is the how we're going to get to the vision um, and achieve our, our aspirations. And so we've all had a chance to read this and we've thanked the school committee for helping us to edit it. And you know, this is our final 
uh, mission statement that we have adopted for the district. And so this is just a reminder of what that mission statement is. So we're going to start off by looking at some of the state results and the trends from the spring MCAS. And I'm not going to spend too much on time, but I do, I do want to point out um, to everyone about the just the implementation or the administration of the MCAS and how it's changed over the past years and the impact <clears throat> and the impact of, of those changes from the pandemic. So you see in 2020, we didn't have an MCAS because that was at the inception of the in the spring of the pandemic. 2021, they gave half the test. And then, so the full test was administered in 2022 and 2019. So a lot of the comparisons you'll see in the data that we're going to make is between 2022 and 2019. And that's the reason why, because of the, the fluctuation in the way that the, the MCAS was administered over the past few years. So here's some trends from across the state. And then I'll refer back to this because we have um, some of these trends we've, uh, aligns with some of the challenges we have in our own data. Uh, but just looking at that, you see that the math scores have increased. Um, some of the, the ELA scores have declined and our science scores have increased slightly. And I would say we've had, we've done some gains that you'll see from the data that we've had some lots of wins with our science results. And then so two focus areas for improvement is the lower writing scores and that has aligned with our results and uh, early literacy challenges. As uh, Mr. Demon pointed out, we have universally across all schools, uh, we've made adjustments to our early literacy instruction where we are focused on and implemented those structured liter literacy routines across the district. And we've invested heavily in the resources uh, to uh, focus on our early literacy instruction. And then you'll see that student absenteeism across the state remains a challenge. So this is just a, a, a reminder or a slide that they will let you know how to read the student growth uh, percentile uh, scores and it shows the different levels and this, this is also you'll see on those slides you'll see that so you can refer back to it on those slides on how to read um, the various the mean student growth uh, percentiles. And we're not comparing it to 2021 because of the fact that we only administered half the MCAS across the state. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look at our ELA. And I thought the, these are the charts that I used last year in order to show the different the differential from, uh, the, from 2019 to 2021. And so I'm doing the same thing this year, looking at it to segregate it by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender. And so you'll see the changes. If I want to direct your attention to the median and exceeding trends, and the one that's highlighted is where our males have shown an increase of percentage of students that have median and exceeding for uh, grades three through eight in ELA. And then you'll look at the scale score all the way to the right. There's a comparison between 2019 and 2022 and you'll see the differential. So that area is we're aligning with the state and our ELA where those, that's a challenge. And uh, we're meeting that challenge and we'll talk about the steps that we're putting in place in order to meet that challenge. And then this is the same data um, for 10th grade, race, ethnicity, ethnicity, and gender. And I wanna also mention that the, the big deck, we also shared that with you and it has all of the charts mm. but these are the ones i wanted to highlight for this presentation so you can go to the big deck you'll see in the novus materials where you can see all of the data so just looking here is a win as you see our hispanic latino student population at the 10th grade again i want to direct your attention to the median exceeding there's a big increase in students that are median exceeding in that category and you'll see that the scaled score is also an increase between 2019 and 2022. And then you look at our white students, there's also an increase. And then for our female students population, there's an increase, even though that the scaled score is slightly uh, decreased. So this is looking at our, our student growth percentiles. And again, this is just for 2022, because you cannot compare the student growth percentile to 2021. So this will be our benchmark year, but I want to highlight the fact that 
for our uh, students from grades three through eight, race, ethnicity, and gender is disaggregated. Um, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender, you'll see that we had typical to high growth and we exceeded the state in each of those groups. All of our student groups ex exceeded the state. And again, looking at grades three through eight, looking at economic uh, disadvantage. So that category is now low economic. It is a broader net. So they've uh, adjusted <coughs> the um, criteria to meet that um, category. And so now it's low income. And again, looking at these other student groups, because we wanted to disaggregate it beyond just race, ethnicity, and gender, you'll see that um, we have typical to high growth and we have exceeded the state in each one of the groups. Again, looking at our 10th grade, again, we're, uh, you'll see the typical to high growth. It's uh, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. And again, we have typical to high growth and exceeded the state or aligned with the state. And so we're gonna look at math and again, using the same uh, tables or charts, we're looking at the, I'm gonna direct your attention to the median exceeding, an increase in percentage of students and our, uh, our Asian students, uh, grades three through eighth. There's an uh, increase in percentage of students meeting and exceeding and looking at the scaled score in comparison to 2019, there's an increase. And then looking at the other uh, uh, identifiers, uh, our former ELs, you'll see that there's an increase and then there's no change, which I consider that a win based upon the challenges we had over the past few years due to the pandemic. And then for our 10th grade, race, ethnicity, and gender, you'll see where those, uh, we've had those increases on median exceeding and in the scaled score and which of those student groups have shown that increase. And again, for math, um, this is a, a challenge, as you can see, that we've had a decrease. And again, but looking at the scale score, the reason why it's highlighted is because it's an increase in the scale score, but we want to see more st of our students in the median exceeding category. So it's a challenge and a win. And then looking at in math, the student growth uh, percentiles, again, uh, lots of high growth, typical to high growth, we've exceeded the state so this is definitely a win looking at the other groups for grades three through eight again typical to high growth exceeding the state and then looking at our science technology and engineering outcomes this is where you see a lot of growth where I think uh, where you saw the state the increase in scores across the uh, state and this is our grades five and eight, because that's those are the grades that take the uh, science, technology, and engineering um, MCAS. Uh, and we have our science coach here, so I want to highlight the work that they've done with science. Um, and you'll see that this is the, the results of that hard work. Looking at grades five to eight, five and eight, the other groups, uh, you'll see that, again, an increase. So here's some more uh, additional accountability outcomes. So when you compare our school district to other school di schools of similar size, you'll see that our 2022 percentiles are, are very high. We've shown um, I'm, it's definitely a win when compared to 2019. And again, you take into consideration the challenges that we've had uh, that we are and we compare to other schools. You look at each one of the individual schools, other uh, K through five schools and middle schools and our high school, you'll see that our, our, percent, our percentiles are pretty high when you look at the accountability um, criteria and how we performed in comparison to those other schools and school districts. And you'll see that, you know, we've increased our percentiles. So uh, that definitely is hats off to all of our staff for the work they've done. And again, addressing the challenges. We know we still have challenges, but this is definitely a win. 
So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Holman, and she's going to talk about the uh, wins and challenges with chronic absenteeism or challenge. All right. So we are tag teaming a bit because we really want to sort of present a full picture of all of the different data points that we look at when we think about outcomes. Uh, we don't consider outcomes just what MCAS tells us, um, but also what the accountability system tells us. Accountability takes into account other factors like some of the ones that I'm going to talk about here, um, one of which is chronic ab absenteeism. You heard from our um, team at Pierce, and I know that this is something that's on the minds of teams all across the district, that our chronic absenteeism has gone up and went up even from the pandemic year of 2020 to 21 into last year of 21-22. And this is something we're monitoring closely. It's important to note that the state, this is a statewide trend, that the state has taken this into account. Um, in the accountability percentile calculations for this year, and they've actually considered chronic absenteeism for this past school year as 20% of days missed or more. But what I'm reporting here is 10% of days missed or more, and that's intentional. I think it's really important that we look at this graph for what it is and that we not compare apples to uh, bigger apples or different apples because <laughs> it is still a good comparison to make. But if you start looking at it as 20% for last year and essentially saying it's because of the pandemic, I think to some extent that's, uh, to a lot of extents, that's true. However, it's, it's going to go back to 10%. And this is something that we have to recover from and that we have to work on um, and that we need to understand is a major challenge for a lot of our families. And that if chronic absenteeism continues at this rate, we'll start to see big impacts in other parts of students' lives, in their connections to school, in their sense of belonging, um, and in their academics. So our, our chronic absenteeism also displays the same gaps that some of our academic outcomes do. Our students with disabilities last year missed stu school at a higher rate and at an increasing rate over the past several years um, than their peers. Our students uh, who are identified as low income are missing school at a more uh, significant rate, particularly last year than their peers. And so those are two of the trends I'm highlighting here. You have more data available to you broken down at the school level in your materials for tonight. And this is going to be something that we focus on both in strategic planning and as we think about um, what kind of data we want to track throughout the year. So we're, uh, the principals and I are working on how we keep track of these data throughout the year, how we do some um, dipsticks at quarter, on a quarterly basis at least to see what our chronic absenteeism is looking like and what kinds of mechanisms we can put in for outreach with the resources we have this year uh, to make sure that we're, make, that we're articulating to families the importance of making sure that students are in school so that we can have a big impact and see some of these trend lines go a different direction next school year. I'd also like to highlight a couple of wins and some challenges when it comes to advanced coursework completion. This is another uh, data point that the state takes into account when they look at accountability um, and factor in accountability. We have an increase in our participation in advanced coursework for our students in the high needs and low income areas um, and subgroups. This is only for the high school. This is worth noting. Uh, the state sort of qualifies certain courses as advanced coursework and then when we report what students are enrolled into the state they use that data to determine what the advanced coursework rate is and then they factor that into high school accountability metrics. Um, we are seeing however that some of our students from um, subgroups like our Asian students, our African American and black students, Hispanic Latino students and multiracial students um, are not participating in advanced coursework at the same rate as their peers. And so this is something we want to take a look at, pay attention to. It's not something that we've sort of historically paid attention to, but is a factor when it comes to our accountability ratings and obviously is something we've spoken about when we've talked about heterogeneous grouping. Um, so it's worth us um, taking a look at. We also identified some errors in our data reporting at the high school as we were looking at advanced coursework completion, and we have resolved many of those. Um, we actually weren't reporting some courses that are considered advanced coursework as advanced coursework to the state, and taking a look at this helped us identify some of those flaws, and we're working on correcting that in our systems now so that the data that goes to the state is accurate and we can get credit for our students who are taking advanced coursework and getting credit for that. We're also, as you noted, um, in the school improvement plans, tracking climate and culture uh, data from our panorama surveys. We're really looking forward to having two years to compare when we do the surveys this fall. Some notable challenges and wins are that when we disaggregate student sense of belonging by race, we see some of the same trends that we do academically. Um, 
the sense of belonging category is one that a lot of folks honed in on this year, as you'll notice. Um, and as Dr. McNeil has noted, that's going to be a theme for us. We really are also quite uh, focused on student sense of belonging by their identification as transgender or their identification by gender because we are noticing that our students who identify as transgender not only report higher rates of suicidality on some of our surveys that we do with the Middlesex League, our, our youth uh, risk behavior survey, but also that they're reporting more challenges when it comes to sense of belonging at school, feeling connected to school, feeling like they're held to high expectations at school and the relationships that they have between students and teachers. And so this is a big concern, something we wanna make sure that we're addressing um, operationally and making sure we have inclusive environments for our students at school and in our relationships with students and making sure everyone feels represented and included at school. And as Mr. Dingman noted, our student belonging data often is mirrored by our staff belonging data. So we have a lot of students and staff who say, I feel very respected at school. And then when you dig into that data at the district level and you ask deeper questions like, uh, how well do people understand you as a person? How connected do you feel to other adults? How much do you feel like you matter? you see those numbers dip. Uh, respect is one form of trust, but when you really sort of unpack trust, when scholars have talked about what trust is and what the components of it are, um, feeling a sense of belonging is sort of a deeper version of trust that um, it needs to be developed among staff if we're going to be able to model it well for students. And so we're keeping an eye on this as well. If you disaggregate this by um, race with staff, you'll also notice that our staff of color report even lower sense of belonging in, in our schools. So of course it's not a surprise that that's mirrored in our student population. All right, Dr. McNeil. Thank you very much. I'll tell you what we're going to do about it now. All right, so I know <laughs> I, I'm reading all of your minds, so you're thinking like, okay, so what are some steps we're gonna do to address these challenges? And again, I, wanna, I don't wanna um, miss out in saying that we still have an achievement gap amongst our students of color and other uh, students from other groups when compared to our white students. So we know that that is a challenge that we're gonna to continue to try to, to continue to address. Um, and so some of the, these are some of the things that we have uh, identified would be some next steps. So as you have uh, learned in, in previous reports, we are definitely um, continue our work to identify a new core literacy, K-5 core literacy um, program you can see some of the artifacts around the room. We actually had a core literacy uh, team meeting today and we talked about the process that we're going to implement in order to select that new core program. And that's gonna take place this year with the target of implementing and coming up with the implement, implementation plan for 2023 and 2024. Uh, we did uh, complete a comprehensive equity audit and I was just at the uh, department meeting yesterday for one of, uh, at math department meeting for middle school and they were talking about, they were going through the findings and talking about the things that they would like to uh, uh, select as goals for this year from that equity report. So our curriculum leaders and our coaches and our, our teachers, our uh, building administrators are diving into the findings and, and, and that is also take, being taken in consideration as they're creating their school improvement plans. So just looking at some of the common themes, um, as you see in the school improvement plans is increasing belonging through a focus on student discourse and academic content areas. And you saw uh, evidence of that from tonight's presentation, school improvement plan presentations. Um, we have a common theme in the secondary department, which is a focus on equitable grading practices. Um, we also are diving into a text for, uh, for our curriculum leader meetings and it's called Grading for Equity. So we're gonna use that as a foundation for that discussion. And we also have uh, one of our staff members that's leading a district-wide uh, um, three-part, or actually it's a six-part six module for our district-wide uh, professional development um, sessions that we have going on throughout the year. And it's focusing on equitable grading practices using that text. And we're looking uh, on another common theme is continued work increasing representation in uh, curriculum materials based on previous SEL and the curriculum audit that we had completed by uh, Dr. Dina Simmons. And I just alluded to it that we've reformatted our professional learning. Um, if you, uh, Mr. Hayner has taken a look at it and seen the menu of courses that we're offering, covers a wide range of interests and topics. 
uh, that we uh, utilize surveys from teachers in order to identify those topics, and we have um, contracted outside consultants, and we also have many of our staff have stepping up, stepping up to the plate and leading and facilitating those learning sessions. So I'm very excited about that. The first session starts next Wednesday, and uh, lots of uh, positive feedback from staff as they're looking at the menu of courses and they're excited about the learning that's going to take place. And the common theme is the tier one universal instruction. So looking at priority area two, valuing all staff. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I, let me go back to that last one. That was the, I wanna say priority area as we look at our strategic planning process. This is our priori, priority area one, ensuring equity and excellence. And so all these action steps are aligning with that um, priority area. And so the next one is Priori priority, priority, I cannot say the word. Okay, priority area two, valuing all staff. So again, um, one of the uh, sessions that we have, is we have uh, our DEI director and our social studies director, uh, Caitlin uh, Moran, they're leading a group and they're, um, which is talking about how to work, uh, set up affinity groups, and it actually is an affinity group for um, our BIPOC staff and our white staff. And so we want to um, set up opt-in affinity groups across the district for all staff. And that goes to that theme of a sense of belonging. And so I just talked about reformatting the professional learning. It's choice-based. Um, and it's sustained engagement in topics of interest and relevance to staff. Uh, so that we just talked about that. And then number three, implementation of options for non-professional status educators to meet that we've negotiated through the uh, contract, uh, the negotiation for a new contract, new 18 hours of racial identity professional learning. Again, we have staff can achieve those 18 hours definitely through our district-wide professional learning sessions and on November 8th where the theme is around DEI. And then we have our DEI and Human Resource Office checking in with new staff members at the start of the school year, making sure that they feel supported uh, and also looking at our uh, new staff orientation. We have ideas how to improve and have, have that process evolve for next year. And then number five, focus on building belonging for staff through small actions. And you'll see what those steps are. Greeting everybody, doing a follow-up uh, if you have a conversation, uh, give specific gratitudes. I know that we've had our instructional rounds, and I myself, I can talk about things I've done as I've lost, left very st uh, specific sticky notes for teachers as I do walkthroughs through their classroom, highlighting the things that they're doing well. And... Um, taking learning risks, so we have to build trust so people are gonna take learning risks in order to facilitate growth and joy. Again, we talked about that productive struggle. Now, turn it over to Dr. Holman. All right. gonna bring us home. I'll do the last th two priority areas. So priority area three, which we are currently doing planning around is improving infrastructure, operations, and sustainability. We have um, accelerated our update of playgrounds in partnership with the town department after several of them were um, closed down last year. We're very much looking forward to opening up some playgrounds and I have uh, some updates on that later on in my superintendent's report. We're obviously continuing the work on the new high school, watching it go up right outside my window um, every day, and it's very exciting. We cannot wait to see um, phase two continue to take to take shape, and we're we've really been collaborating on a supportive start to the 2023-24 school year, as you all know, for our AHS students as we look forward to moving into phase two. Um, we're still refining our budget proposal and planning process and we're making some tweaks to that this year to make sure that we're sharing out um, sort of what we're prioritizing as we go and as we make decisions and involving our administrators and stakeholders in that process this school year even more and we are looking forward to doing some planning as part of our strategic planning for eventual improvements to Audison Middle School and are planning some HVAC upgrades at the Dallin Elementary School later this year as well. 
And then in priority area four, which is focused on sustaining collaborative partnerships with our families and our community, we will be doing four, actually the number is five, um, community forums for interested stakeholders to learn about the equity audit recommendations and provide some feedback on strategic initiative drafts. We appreciate um, anybody attending these who has any interest in them. Um, you only need to attend one, but we're definitely looking forward to um, getting some feedback on initiative drafts. We will be doing a staff forum, which is why I say there will be five. We're planning a staff forum. We haven't quite nailed down a date for that yet, but one that will allow teachers to participate in this without needing to add another evening to their schedule. So we're working on a date for that and we'll advertise it soon. We're continuing our design work on the new website and the migration of school sites to that new content management system um, in hopes that our website can be easier to access, easier to find information on for all of our families and improve our communication systems. As you're aware, we're piloting the Before School Care Program and are looking forward to reporting back out on that as families have articulated a need for more uh, care opportunities on the front and back end of the school day. We're also working on making sure that we can include more students in our aftercare programs and have continued hiring staff as we have moved into the fall and have welcomed more students into our after school care programs as the fall has gotten started and some of our staffing challenges have been alleviated. Um, still exist, but are, are improving. And we're continuing expansion and accessibility updates for our APS communication systems, including the systems we use to message families and to ensure everything is translated and easy for families to access. And with that, we will take any questions that you have about this year's outcomes. Thank you. Um, before I take questions, I just want to let Amy, Mo, and Tamaki know mm -hmm. that if um, they need to go home or would like to go home, you are welcome <laughs> to, to, um, to head out. But thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention is I called this the MCAS report on the agenda because I know when people go back and try to search for it, MCAS is sort of a, a tag or a search item that they um, that they use. So I wanted to make sure this was accessible for people in the future, but I appreciate mm -hmm. the, the broader um, outcomes re report. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Slickman and then Ms. Morgan. Yeah, the, one, the couple things I noticed, uh, first of all, is that the Odyssey's percentile ranking among all the middle schools was outstanding. I mean, what were they, 97, 98? 97. 97. I mean, that's, that's outstanding. Um, and the Addison, it, it, you know, 20 years ago was a school we were worried about. Now it's uh, the crown jewel of the system, uh, at least in terms of the accountability. They're doing quite well, and I, I think we have a lot to be proud of. The other thing I want to note is that when we report out data for schools for growth scores, it's a measure of central tendency. So a 60 isn't high. It's really in the 85th percentile of schools about because you're looking at a distribution of means, and that's a very tight distribution. So that these 60s that I'm seeing here are 85th, 90th, 95th percentile among schools in the state. So. When we see that, it's even more impressive than it looks if you're comparing that to the kids scale. Uh, scale. So some really, really, really good news in the outcomes. And the, the discussion of where we're going from here and how we're going to build upon these strengths, I think was a very impressive discussion. I feel we're in good hands right now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Ms. Morgan. Um, Dr. Rooney, I just wanted to sort of talk about the take home on the SGPs. I, I just want to make sure we're sort of being, you know, as as clear as possible. Because so so what you're if can we go back to the slide? Um, it's slide. Oh, gosh. Um, a 14 of 38. In the presentation deck. Yeah. So, I mean. Am I right that a that a that typical growth is forty to fifty nine, right? And high growth is sixty to seventy nine. So we're saying for for ELA it's it's typical to high growth, but I mean it, it's like really typical growth, right? Well, for, like, a, for a student, not for the the average. I, but I'm looking at this like this 
like mm -hmm. right here, right? Our, our scores are all 59, 51. There are a couple 61s for Asian students and female students in our district, mm -hmm. right? I guess uh, to me, this looks like typical growth. It doesn't look like typical to high growth in, in ELA. It's typical and high growth, yes. But, but, that's but there's the, a, it's a lot more typical than it is high. That's the mean. Yes, and it's on the top the end. Board. The typical growth scores here are, for the most part, on the high end of that typical growth range. Right. Okay. So it's the high end. All right. But yes, they're typical. They I would mean, be in the typical kind of semantic, range. But I think what's what what I I guess my what I find difficult about how this is presented is that it I feel like it it doesn't really. Like you're, you're telling me that in ELA, it's all typical to high growth, which for 10th grade ELA, it's all of our district growth scores are all 51, 53 or below. So they're all typical anyway. So there's no high growth there. Um, and it, to me, I feel like it then sort of dilutes what happened in math, which is like legitimately high growth in math. Right. So I, I guess I just want to make sure that when we talk about it, we're talk like I, I feel like if we're if we're trying to like squidge ourselves over and be high or high typical, it, it I feel like it, it then dilutes when it is actually truly high growth, which is what happened in math. So I guess I just as this sort of goes out and we talk about it in different meetings, I, I just I, I think it's really important to be really true to these the scales that that we've been given and make sure that that you know when we talk about math that's like the the idea that all of these growths are all being represented as typical to high to me feels a little squishy so that's my feedback thank you Mr. Schlickman. Could we and just then redo, Dr. Uh, just quickly, uh, could we redo that chart instead of doing it with the means? Is to, uh, do a chart, uh, a bar growth uh, of the percentage of kids in very low, low, moderate, high, and very high. I yes, there are charts that are available for that. That 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 I think would paint the picture better because the the graphing of the means doesn't really portray the distribution. I will, I will mm -hmm. look at that graph and we can insert that in there, yes. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I guess, so I appreciate the, the presentation and especially the, the backed up information at the end. Um, but one question I have is when or will we be discussing the achievement gaps or when are they being discussed in, in professional meetings? How is, you know, because that's what, one of the things we wanna be focusing on, but we haven't even discussed it here, right? We're just comparing groups to what they did prior, which is useful information, but part of what we're trying to do is decrease achievement gaps and we haven't even talked about them here. And clearly, I mean, I, I know um, Dr. McNeil did mention it in his summary at the end, but uh, the, the slides and the data don't have anything about that. I'm just wondering what's the next steps with that. Thank you. So, uh that is one of the reasons we are adopting, an, I'll give an example. That is an, one of the reasons we are adopting a new K-5 core universal literacy program because we've read the research on our current program. It shows that it's not, and looking at the, adult, the, the results from not only the MCAS but our iReady, looking at our ELA scores and understanding that it's not servicing all of our students. So it is our hope as we continue to focus on early literacy, we adopt a new K-5 literacy core program that that will raise student achievement and decrease the achievement gap between our students of color, other groups, 
and our majority white students. So that is something that is embedded in every conversation that we have. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with any curriculum leader, Dr. Holman, anyone that does not take into consideration the achievement gap that we are continually trying to address, which is another reason why we had the comprehensive equity audit take place. So we have looked at those findings and again, taking into consideration the recommendations and seeing where, we, where that implementation can take place. And over time, as we implement these things, as we continue to address the achievement gap, another example would be the equitable grading practices looking at how that can present a barrier, how we are grading our students to some of our students based upon their uh, race and ethnicity. So again, looking, those are two examples, three actually with the equity audit that we are, that could be considered a next step as us addressing the achievement gap and opportunity gap that exists within our, our district. Right, and I understand that those are solutions intended for that but my point is just that we're not even looking at what is the achievement gap now what was it how has it changed well, I, do you see what i'm saying i do it, but I, the, the, the charts are also showing in uh, how we disaggregate the data that's one way that we present the, the achievement gap because if you look at the charts it's comparing how those different groups of students are doing in comparison to the last time they gave the full uh, MCAS. So I will pass it over to Dr. Holman. Right. She has some comments as well. Before before okay. Dr. Holman says anything, I also just want to point out that the that all of these um, these results were released not that long ago, and Dr. McNeil um, went through all of this and created this presentation to have it ready for us on this date. So I, I will let Dr. Holman share, but I also think that if um, the committee feels like they'd like to have another discussion at another time that more specifically addresses something, we can do that. Um, but I know Dr. McNeil did a lot of work to get this presentation ready for us for this evening. Um, and I, I do see a lot of, of, of addressing that gap in, in what you have here. But if it needs to be something that we talk about more explicitly, we can certainly Absolutely. Do that. Dr. Hoban. It, it, I mean, there is some of it in, in the big deck, the 52 yes. deck um, 18. Slide 18 has the ELA. Yeah, but slide eight, slide eight has a much better description of it, but that's the state data only. So if we yes. can get slide eight for the district data, that I think is what we're looking for. Slide eight of the big deck? In the big yeah. deck. So I this think- This is like 18 is the one we're familiar with that we've seen before, but it is, I, I like slide eight better. Yeah. So yeah, slide eight, um, let me see slide eight. Right, so if, if, okay. if that is the type of representation of the data that you would like to see, I could do that um, because then I could, it, it would show the, the discrepancy or the, the, the gap between the different groups and our white students. So I can definitely represent the data that way. Um, and um, then, yes. And slide 18 yeah, it's, it's is missing the one yeah it's missing the other category. Mm -hmm. It's only doing race and ethnicity. So I think but that's sort of the analysis I think we were looking for. I'll, I'll yeah I think there's there's a lot of different ways you can sort of slice and dice um, these data and we certainly were in a bit of a crunch for time. I did want to share w with everybody here, not this but this, uh, what the administrators get and one of the ways that we do look at data as a team is with graphs like these that we do that show that have those same trend lines that the chronic absenteeism did and they get access to the the administrators get access to this and we break it out by scaled score we have growth on the other side um, we do it by all the different subgroups that we're focused on in all of the different content areas and then they look at year over year trends one of the and so they've used this to build school improvement plans. You can see at the bottom of the spreadsheet, it's broken out by each individual school. Uh, these are representations that we can also provide and have access to if that's something that the committee would like to see some analysis of. But I just wanted to emphasize that our leaders do use these um, in order to sort of identify what the gaps are and whether they're growing or shrinking and where gaps are growing and shrinking. Um, and so that's another way that sort of we can convey some of these data. And um, I had one other point, 
but I've lost it, so I'll stop talking. Mr. Thelen? Um, well, Thanks. I didn't know if oh. Dr. Allison oh, Ambien, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Did that, did that Those, answer your question? Yeah, that, that helped a lot. The graphs, um, especially that Dr. Homer was showing, are really helpful. And um, I would like, I'm personally interested in seeing some stuff like that. I don't know if the rest of the committee is, uh, and I'm not sure how much, but uh, I just get concerned. I, I understand that there are a number of things that are in progress, and my initial question wasn't, why didn't we see this now, but when will we, or are we going to see this? Um, so I also understand that it hasn't been that long that the data has been released, but uh, it's just, I feel like if we're going, if we're trying to focus on something, we need to look at it too. And you folks may be looking at it because you have access to a lot of data that we do not. And I was just pointing out that we can't look at it because we don't have it, or at least not in those forms. I understand there's a couple in the big deck, um, but the stuff that Dr. Homo was showing us is, is really getting it, kind of what I was wondering about. So thank you. Okay, so if we could, if you want to send me some questions or some examples that you would like to see, like again, you, the data, as Dr. Homan stated, can be represented in many different ways, and so I could work on another deck that's more explicit at showing the the we achievement can talk gap. About okay. What, yeah, yeah. How to move forward with that? Um, I'm just getting. We've been on this topic for 40 minutes, just to give everybody a time check. I am. Dick I'll be quick. Like, oh, Mr. Thelen, go ahead. <laughs> There's a lot of data here. Thanks very much. When you saw the data, I guess Dr. Holman, Dr. Mignon, like like what jumped out of you is like, oh my God, this was really good. Or, 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 or I'm surprised by this data. And then what jumped out of you is, wow, we got to like. We got to do something about this issue. <clears throat> well, yes, I, I, I think uh, for me, uh, like I said before, as I look at the data, the continuation of the uh, gap, achievement gap that we have between our, especially our black African American students and um, our majority white students, and then looking at the other groups of students as you look at the um, low income students, our EL students and our, um, all, of, all of our groups. I would like to see all of our groups achieving at a much higher rate, and I would like to see the, us continue to decrease that achievement gap. I'm very excited about the early literacy work that we're doing. I think that is definitely gonna have an impact not only in literacy, but it's gonna impact how our students are able to comprehend and um, understand non-fictional text. And I know that an another thing I did not talk about um, in this uh, data report or this outcomes report is the work that we need to do with our writing. And that is something that did come out, that jumped out at me as I, I have right here. When you look at the standards and you break it down by standards and understanding why certain groups of students are not achieving at a certain level, writing is a big part of that. Okay. And for ELA mm -hmm. and then in math, it's like geometry. So being able to break it down by standards and look at those items. So again, I, I want to us to continue to look at our universal instructional practice. Our seventh and eighth grade math teachers adopted a new curriculum resource last year, and the student growth at Audison in math was off the charts, which is very exciting. It means that resource was well implemented. The teachers were on the same page in working with it. That it was a new resource. So for growth to be so high when a new resource is being implemented speaks to the quality and power of the planning that they did with the math department like wow I would attribute Audison's excellent percentile to the work of all of the educators in that building but the student growth in math in seventh and eighth was definitely a big part of that um, I would agree with surprise with science <laughs> yeah our increase in yeah, science the increase in science was a great was a like nice surprise and was awesome the um, gap for low-income students is significant and when you really look at what you want to see in student growth is that student groups who you need to accelerate have a higher growth percentile 
than student, you want to see high growth for all students, but you want to see a higher growth score for groups that you're focused on than you do for groups that you might not be as focused on because their achievements are already high. Um, and we're not seeing that as much as we might like to. So, it, and we're not, you know, the pandemic, one of the reasons why I might hesitate to throw some of those graphs like I just showed you on a slide with the um, trend line from 2017 to 2022 is because that's showing a trend over five years of pandemic learning. And we know that the pandemic had all sorts of impacts on students that were not within the control of the school system. And so what we really want to try to do this year is establish a baseline. Um, we can compare it to 2019. That's useful in that it tells us where we're at relative to before all of this happened. But this year gives us a really strong baseline for establishing whether or not the work we're doing is closing gaps or not, because we know that the pandemic widened gaps really significantly and that that was only exacerbated last year. So I, we can share, tr we'll share trends, absolutely, and take a look at some of that gap analysis, but I would say take that with, a, with the grain of salt required uh, because of what the pandemic did to some of those equity gaps across our society in all sorts of areas. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Science camp overnight experience update. And Ms. Diggins, kid, Amber Bus was going to be a part. Amber Bus was going to, is she a, a she dish, part of yeah. The, she went to, no, she just went to attend. So oh, she, she just, okay. I didn't know if she wanted she, to. She's more than happy to. Do you want her to Ms. Duffy, do you promote it as a participant? You can put her as a participant, absolutely. I want to welcome. Ms. Duffy, who is the PTO president for Gibbs and Addison. And Ms. Huber, who's here, one of our science. And I, and I will say this. So the, the immersive science camp materials are in the notes. Okay, all right. So welcome. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want me to add the science immersive slide deck into Novus so that the full committee could see them? Because these, and I'm going to talk about the slide deck, but I was wondering, Ms. Morgan, do you think that would be a good idea? Yeah, they were great slides. Yeah. Okay. They did get sent out to the full committee via email, I believe, prior to that meeting. But I think mm -hmm. if you're going to reference that, which I suspect you'll reference that part of that conversation yeah. potentially, then I think right. it's helpful to have it there after the fact. Perfect. Thank you. So we did meet with the CIAA um, subcommittee, when was it, last week? And we presented our slides and we focused on science camp and we were given some feedback and we took that feedback because we did not have an overnight option. And so one of the things that we did decide at the end of that meeting is that we were going to separate because, and I'll, and I'll get more into the reason why, uh, we're gonna separate actually the, the focus on science. We're gonna not use that as a focal point as we look at the overnight experiences. So you will look and you will see, in order to avoid like having the overnight experiences be just like an ultimate sleepover or something like that, we also wanted to have a focus, right? We wanted to have a focus around leadership, around community building. But as you think about a sleepover, you wanna still have that type of joy. And that was something that was expressed through the different emails and letters I received from parents. And so I wanted to give some context there so that everybody understands as we're going through this slide deck that you'll see that you'll say, probably wonder, well, it's not focusing on science. Well, that's intentional. And we also wanted to, it's not gonna be couched in um, fifth grade because of the um, not really focusing on science. So we're looking at sixth grade. And so I reached out to Madame Pierre Maxwell. I reached out to Ms. Duffy, who was the PTO president, and we had a conversation, an initial conversation. So I'm gonna get into the slide deck. That was some context so that everybody understands where we're st starting at, all right? So we're going to share options. And so we did reach out to other vendors 
again, looking at just an overnight experience, but still focusing on community building. Like, and, and, and we looked at certain vendors that had gave us an opportunity to also customize that experience for students. And so we could align it with the core values of Gibbs. And so we can make it um, however we want to make it. So going into the next slide. So this slide deck is just going to look at the options for the overnight experience, <coughs> discuss the pros and cons, and then we'll open it up for questions. I promise you I'll make this quick. Um, so again, looking at the context, it will be explored for sixth grade students. Um, it will not be attached to the science curriculum. We would like to partner with the Gibbs PTO, and we'll talk about our next steps that Ms. Duffy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops, sorry. Thank you. And then our initial in inquiry included a three day, two night experiences. All right. And then, um, and it only includes vendor costs. So we still have to, um, as you look at the cost, we still have to add in transportation. So our first option is the Morse Hill Outdoor Education Center. And what we did, we called, and I would like to highlight Chelsea Austin, who works in our office at Admin Assistant. She did a phenomenal job researching some of these options because I have multiple reports to do, so I just want to give um, highlight Chelsea and her efforts. Um, but you'll see we took notes, and these are some of the highlights from those notes. So you can see what some of the experiences that students can have as they can learn SEL skills, team building, communication, and they can also do fun activities. Again, thinking about that sleepover experience, getting that integrated in there, not just focusing on these things. Um, we wanna make sure they're having joy, they're having fun. Um, but there's no nurse on staff, but all staff are trained on medication administration, first aid and CPR. And for students who are on an IEP, again, that was one of my concerns, making sure that we are opening this up to all students, that they could participate. So what type of support are the different vendors gonna provide us in, when we have students that may learn differently? And so we have students on an IEP or need a, a behavior support, so they have staff that have been trained in order to support those students who may have certain challenges. And, um, they train their staff in that and that's part of their uh, company's philosophy. But we still need to do uh, more research to determine the cost. They weren't really forthcoming with the cost. I don't know why, but they wanted to know specifically the day, the date, everything before they were going to give us a cost. So we're going to continue to reach out to them to determine that, to get that information. And then as you can see, if you click on that link, it will take you to their website. So if you need more, if you want to just explore their website and learn more about that vendor, you can do so. You can send them the links. I'll have to send you the one because this is a PDF. So I just highlight some of the pros and cons. It can be some of the pros. It can be customized to fit our needs. Um, it appears that the program can be differentiated for different learning styles. Staff have been trained to administer uh, medication but there's no nurse on staff, so we need to bring a nurse. And I, you know, I, I have the, it's me being overprotective, but I would want to understand what that looks like when you have staff just mm -hmm. administering medication without a nurse on staff. And any other students who may have more significant um, health issues, mm -hmm. how does that work? So we still have more research to do as it relates to that. Option two, the farm school. Has anybody heard of the farm school? You have, right. So, um, you have? I have. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, it's actually running a farm. <clears throat> so the students, depending on the year, is that, that's going to determine the activities that they will participate in. So, I've never lived on a farm, I've never worked on a farm, um, <laughs> so I know that I would have to learn more about this, but you see some of the examples of some of the activities they can participate in. Um, and the teachers would have to, we would have to have teachers come and provide supervision. There's no nurse on staff. Um, all staff are trained in uh, providing first aid and CPR. Um, they, they do 
uh, have uh, tr staff trained to provide support for students on an IEP. Um, they allow parents to chaperone, but a lot of the vendors were not I mean, they said they can come, but that traditionally that's not what happens. Um, and then the cost. One thing I liked about this, it seems like they were willing to work with you on the cost so that, you know, students could participate. It wouldn't be a barrier. And then you see there's a link to a sample schedule. I think it's a sample two day schedule. Um, and again, the pros, there's fl flexibility with the cost per student. When you do send adults, they are not charged, but you it's limited, you can't send everybody. Um, students learn about working on a farm, very hands-on. Supervision relies on teacher participation. Again, there's no staff, these are our cons. Limited scope of the program. Everything revolves around farm activities. So, you know, <laughs> not a lot of options there. This one I really... Uh, hey now. <laughs> I can't. The kids may like it, some kids may not like it. I'm just saying, like, you know, you want to have, like, choice. But there's, you know, I don't know if the, how much choice is going to be there. So, Meryl Vista. Um, this is one I, I was very intriguing to me. I, I, I really like this one. They'll craft a program that lines up with the values of the school um, and the support, what our school is already doing. Again, Gibbs has a strong focus on SEL, so I really like that. Um, and they have engineering uh, uh, concepts built into this. They can build a raft, depending on the activity, shelter in the woods, learn how to build a fire. This seems like a true camp experience, which I've never had. Um, overnight supervision uh, will be the teachers. Uh, it's one adult for every one to 12 students. They ask that staff that the school bring a nurse. Again, that's uh, remains to be a, 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 a concern of mine. As long as we can provide, have a nurse come. Uh, we'd have to think about how that's going to happen. But their staff is trained in first aid, and then you see the cost. And uh, adults are free for every one adult up to 12 students. And then you see a sample, i uh, got to correct that typo, two-day schedule. Pros, the vendor works to align the program with values of the school. Students learn about engineering by building different things, relies on teachers, these are some of the con, on teachers, uh, on teacher participation, another typo, I have to fix that. No nurse on staff, and staff cannot administer medication. So that is a con. Nature's Classroom, I know a lot of people are familiar with this. When parents emailed me, they put this up as an option. And again, you can read about that. Um, they have a ropes course. Uh, we have to provide overnight supervision, but we can pay extra for them to provide the overnight supervision. And we have to understand how, what that look, you know, how much of a cost that is. And there is a nurse on staff, 24-7, and available uh, overnight for emergencies. So that's a, definitely a pro. Um, and then this is more bullets can, uh, with that. And then the pros, program can be customized, can be connected to science if we would like it to be. If you pay extra, nighttime supervision. Staff are trained to address different learning styles. There are nurses on staff. This cost, uh, the cost can be very expensive with the add-ons. And so I'll open it up to questions and comments that you have. Mr. Hainer. You mentioned I did, the program's adjusting to the curriculum. I have a concern with time away from the regular curriculum, uh, especially, especially tonight when we're talking about absenteeism and stuff. Do you see our curriculum being continued in these programs potentially? It would be more from a, like I said, an SEL focus, looking at, um, which is important, so we're looking at the whole child, their mental health, uh, the SEL skills. I think that would be something that students can definitely benefit from going on having experience like this. But I have some ideas that I've shared with Ms. Duffy. I don't know, Ms. Duffy, do you want to say anything about our conversation that we had um, and your thoughts? Because I, I definitely want to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts. So um, as I said when we spoke um, a few days ago, 
we're having a PTO meeting on Tuesday evening and my plan is to talk with the board and any parents who attend that meeting about this. I know um, a couple of the board members are on this call listening. Um, I think in my initial ideas of, of this, that to me it seems like this should be a pullout for uh, the PTO towards Gibbs parents because it's those parents that are going to have to participate, especially if, you know, I looked at the slides, I looked at the costs, um, if parents have to attend, what parent is going to do that? Um, I mean, I know my son went with Ms. Morgan's daughter when they had the science camp and I was very happy to write that check and to let somebody else take him for four days and have a great experience. Um, you may have a lot of pushback with, I'm happy to write a check, but I don't really want to go. And so I think putting feelers out to Gibbs parents once we have our meeting we will see, you know, where the rubber meets the road in how many people really want the camp. Can I? So, I mean, that's just my, my initial, you know, feelings on this. Do I think it's a great idea? Absolutely. But it's a big undertaking for just the PTO, I think, to take. I want to add to because I think I heard some in your question about like the role of this when it comes to curriculum and I think we are tasked as a public school system to ensure that anything that is part of our curriculum is something that every single student can participate in right. and so if we were to pursue something like this I think our preference and one of our goals would be to consider whether or not this needs to be something that takes time out of our school hours mm -hmm. that we are required to provide to all students and the way science camp worked previously was that it did take days that were school days um, and students would leave but not all students were able to go and we said it was part of our curriculum so if we were to pursue this one of the things I would hope an organization or a group of parents that were to take it on um, would pursue is making this part of days that are not school days because the reality is we cannot ensure that all students are able to participate in a lot of these options and we know that there are going to be challenges associated with that um, and in the same way that you know some students are able when we partner with other organizations to have experiences that are overnight or international some students attend that and some don't and it's an extracurricular opportunity and so I think it's important that we consider these options as potential extracurricular opportunities. If, if I may just, mm -hmm, right. you brought up a very good point but as a teacher who participated in one of these programs when I taught, I never thought about that interaction with my students on a 24 hour period and I gotta be very frank and honest with you, I loved teaching for 32 years, I did it once I would never go back. Yes. Because that relationship, it's important. Mm -hmm. And I support Dr. Holman 100%. This should be for everybody if we're going to have it. Um, mm -hmm. it I think the logistic part of it, and I think going forward, you could, you, how, much, how many parents are going to be there? How many teachers are going to be there? Just to make that piece, and until that's in place, I don't think you can go forward with this. Yeah. The support about it. And I, I, but I also think, you know, if you're if you're concentrating on the um, educational portion of it and not taking away days of schooling for this, I don't think you're going to have as high um, involvement if this happens during a February vacation week or an April vacation week. Um, you'll get pushback from those parents saying, why did you pick it that week? We're going away on vacation. Why, you know, like there, this just seems that it could possibly just be nothing more than continuous. But our responsibility is to the entire student body. Correct. And, and until we can get the entire student body actively involved, it can't be a school program. That it's, it's a catch 22. Yes. 
and that's Both exactly. Ways. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yep. And I would support it as a parent, uh, but at the same time, we have a responsibility on that end. The other end. Sorry. Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I mean, I think we're diving a little bit too into the weeds here. This is more of a subcommittee type discussion, mm -hmm. um, but I think some good ideas are being presented. Uh, I support the continue, continued exploration with support by the administration, with a willing parents group. Mm -hmm. If there is a willing parents group, I, 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 I've been contacted by parents, so I know they're out there that are interested in seeing some sort of experience like this mm -hmm. in Arlington. I, I do think it's worth investing administrative resources, parental resources, and seeing what we can do. I, I, I've like got to ask. Well, let, can, I, can we let people share their first turns. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, okay. Uh, I thought that Ms. Morgan and the administration led a really wonderful meeting uh, in the CIA subcommittee uh, where the conversation was really, really terrific. And what we did was we took apart the two components of the issue that appear to be before us, science and camp. And one of the things we were discussing was could we somehow bring the science aspect to us so that we'd have sort of a science campy experiential out in the field thing uh, at some grade level in that area four five six uh, for for our students um, and I don't want to lose sight of that I, I think that the campsite appears to be very very complicated as we try to go and uh, meet the needs of as many students as possible, not excluding students, and uh, uh, as uh, the folks have said, that the really way to do this would be sort of as an extracurricular activity, maybe run through the community education. Uh, the, the one model I'm thinking of off the top of my head is when we do the last blast, mm -hmm. is that that's a rotating group of kids that come through, but and. and there's enough of a group of parents who are aware of this moving forward so they know that as they approach being a junior, because you don't want senior parents in the last blast, they're going to be, they know to be available for that overnight period. So that if we can communicate with the parents right now that we're thinking about this as sort of an extracurricular, and maybe we can't pull it off for this year, but maybe we can for next year. So we'd be notifying the elementary parents and gather some sort of a committee or group of uh, a steering group of folks who would be able to step in and do that part of it uh, that makes it a com more of a community ed activity rather than a school department activity. But I, I'm, I'm really grateful for this discussion. I know there's a lot of thought going into a lot of research and because we've got you know, brilliant parents in this community who are uh, active and thoughtful and have lots of contacts and resources, I think that you know, if, if we go out there and, and share the questions that we have right now, we, we, we could end up with even more answers and more possibilities in a way to serve as many kids as possible. Mr. Yes, I just want to understand this, the next steps. The next steps are you're going to talk to the Gibbs parents. Yes, yes. Gibbs, Audison, PTO, because we're, we're two PTOs, yeah. or we're one PTO for two schools. Yeah. We're having our meeting on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Go back. I'm going to explain this. I'm going to right. show the slides, say, you know, these are the pros and cons. We need to start some kind of discussion with the Gibbs parents on their pa on their Facebook page to find out who's willing to no. entertain this idea. Okay, so once we have that information, then the curriculum committee meets, or no, or that's it, or, or are we done? Here with well, I think we're making up the plan right, right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. the this, is, this is the plan. Yes. Yeah. The discussion <laughs> is now is to make a plan for what are our next steps, when do we want to meet again, is it going to go to CIAA, yeah. what information so, are we looking for? I don't know if we need a motion or anything, but I think the way it, it's there's I don't know if this group is the right place to make the yeah the operational plan I think you talk to the parents we see what the feedback is Jane's committee meets mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan's committee meets soon takes this information and then with the administration's guidance we see what's possible 
Sounds like a plan. Miss Morgan. I think I, I think it's I think that that crowd is the right one, but I, I mean, can we like realistically are we're not going to pull this off for this year's group of sixth graders? A lot of these venues are probably booked at this point. That is worth a question mm -hmm. to them, like what is available in the spring, um, because that could really narrow if the desire is to pull something off by this year. That could really narrow these options down to very few. Right, and I guess that's what I'm like. I, I think that it's a good crowd to like trial balloon it to, but like if if their kids aren't like, I, I if their kids aren't going to be able to go, right, mm -hmm. because it's October thirteenth, right, then then if I were mm -hmm. a Gibbs parent and I was like, I'm not going to be like I totally am in for this. If my like I want to. I want to do this, but my children aren't going to be able to go. I, I guess that's my concern, right? Is that we're, we're floating it next week to a group of people who it may not even impact. And so that feels like kind of mixed messaging I think to me personally. Somebody, I think somebody needs to get information about available dates mm -hmm. for these four venues prior to the conversation. With the yeah, somebody can get me yeah. info on like, you know, two of you can two just point four. at me and say, "Ride." I mean, so it's like <laughs> well, and it's this guy over here who's never so lived Rod, on a Rod farm get, and never. He just <laughs> volunteered. Or if Rod, Cheryl can call, I can, I can, and, no, and, no, absolutely, we can right. follow up and see what dates are available. That shouldn't the, be that difficult. The other piece of information that I think um, someone needs to get is how many students at a time these places can yes. can mm -hmm. host. Yeah. So that was clear that you know I think the maximum at one of the venues, I can't remember which one, was 120. So I'm looking at learning, like each LC, learning community, would have to go Separate. like mm -hmm. separately, yeah. right? And that's the way we did it, uh, you know, when we had the science camp, um, before, you know, before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Every school had to go at a different time. So you have to stagger it. Mm -hmm. I don't think, so we're looking, we're talking about 500 plus kids. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think any of the venues were able to handle that many no, like, at one right. point in time. But I think it's even important to know, like, how many sets do, is it going to So to we have take five learning because... communities at, we have five learning communities at Gibbs, so we'll be, we'll be five. It'll be five different So, I mean, that's, times. when mm -hmm. you think about the impact on the number of school days that that impacts the entire school, um, you know, for, for band or chorus or whatever, like whole school thing. I just, I think it's important to under, for the committee and the community to understand the, the bigger picture impact mm -hmm. of, uh, of some of this, that with less of an impact at an elementary school, because the, the fifth grade could go from that elementary school and it, it didn't have such an impact. So I, I just more thoughts to put out there. For, mm -hmm. The All the same thoughts that I had <laughs> after our discussion. I was like, lots of different things when you're dealing with sixth grade, or if yep. this was something that was happening at Audison versus, you know, at fifth grade. Yeah, it seems like, so you find out what you find out. Ms. Morgan's committee meets. At the same time, it may mean that, you know, we can't do anything this year, which means that the conversation then has to go to the fifth grade parents. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in their PTOs to see what their interest would be, and we go from there. Great. Mm -hmm. My fifth grader will be excited. <laughs> Morgan, do you know, because I know you've we, got a yeah, lot of so meetings scheduled. Yeah, so we meet scheduled. on the 24th of October. And then we meet again on the 14th of November. So the 24th feels probably tight, but the yeah. 14th They'll of do it. They're smart. The 14th of November. I mean, I don't know. We, we have our meeting dates, always, and either mm, of those we could so good at potentially at least do an update and yeah, have another talk about it. What time on the 24th? I might. <laughs> Is it going to be? No, that, it's the CIAA. So mm. it's, I know. Yeah. Oh, okay. 8.30 a.m. They're all the same. I don't know what I'm doing that day, but all right. I'll just email you whatever <laughs> said, because I'll be at Stratton. Sorry. Do sorry. Dr. Allison Ampey. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, okay, so I'm sorry I missed that CIA meeting, uh, but I wanted to, uh, I'm confused because I thought I understood Dr. Holman to say that it shouldn't be during school. 
but it sounds like you're talking during school. Um, so I'm confused by that. Uh, second, I am confused about how the, I understand the first time's probably a trial and stuff, but part of what I thought we're trying to do is reinstate a tradition. So it'd be going on each year, right? And so it feels like we need more input than just this year Gibbs parents. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not hearing that sort of input. Uh, so I don't, anyway, those are, um, just a couple. Also, I think if we're, we are going to just talk to Gibbs parents, maybe there can be some email communication outside of the meeting because clearly lots of people aren't always at the PTO meetings um, so that you can reach as many parents as possible and, and get opinions from uh, more than just the people who didn't show up for the meeting. But uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm still kind of confused by this whole thing. So I, I like some of the camps sound, I mean, I think all the camps have things and oh, and the other thing I was going to say was in terms of it relating back to the curriculum, if, if, if we're talking about that, to me, this is something that is, it's giving them knowledge. It's giving them something to write about in their journals or, or whatever writing, free writing they have to do. Um, it's giving them an appreciation for when they hear about other science things, they can think, oh, I saw this or I, I did this. Um, I think, so I don't think it has to always be lockstep with the exact things on our curriculum for it to be of um, value. And so I, I don't think we should dismiss it just because it, they don't come with specific curriculum uh, things. I think you figure out what activities are and then, then you build your, you know, you, you tweak what you're already planning to do, do for those, but that, that's just my opinion. So thank you. Ms. Keith. Hi. Um, I think before you do anything, you need to talk to the Gibbs teachers mm -hmm. because they've never heard anything about this. And now there's a public document floating out there that's talking about them chaperoning overnight trips. Mm -hmm. um, I can't wait to see my inbox tomorrow. It's going to be great. <laughs> so, it's, you know, if you're talking about doing this out of school time, that's, that's fine. But if there's possibilities here that this is going to be during the school year, during the school day, especially if you're talking about requiring chaperoning, I think this needs to start with the Gibbs staff. And then once you figure out what their interest is and what their ability to participate is, then you can start to make some decisions after that. Thank you for that. And yes. I just want to say that the, the initial focus was to partner with the PTO and have it be during, like I expressed an idea to Ms. Duffy that it would take place during like a mid-winter break. I was not thinking that the teachers were going to be heavily involved. That's why I put that as a con because and it would be voluntarily right it would be they will volunteer so if they want it if it's during like a mid like some of the trips that we do at the secondary level so i was thinking like using that model so if they want to volunteer and they want to supervise great and that's why we're like looking at the idea of this not taking place during like the week and i shared that idea with miss duffy during our conversation and so looking at instructional time, looking at the supervision, and making that a focal point when we did call each one of the vendors, like what does that look like without us having teachers provide the supervision? Because that was a challenge at the fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine it would be the same challenge. And I wanna make sure that any teacher who's listening, that was my initial thought, that it was not going to take place during the week and that we would not rely upon t teacher supervision because that would fluctuate from year to year.
depending on what's going on in people's lives. So I wanted to make it more of a voluntarily, voluntarily thing where they would do it. Hey, I want to go on that midwinter. I would like to go on that. And so it wouldn't take place during the, during the week. So that was my initial thought process and partnering with the PTO. And that's what we discussed. And, and I think my comment with regard to it happening during what would be vacation weeks in February and in April, I was thinking at it not with the teaching brain, but with the lawyer brain that I have, that I'm going to get pushback from parents because I was looking at the bigger picture. Why, why are you doing this during February vacation? I'm going away with my kids, and they really want to go. You know, like th that's the pushback that I'm anticipating happening whether it's at the PTO meeting or when I put a blast email out asking for parental. You're also not gonna get five chunks during vacation weeks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a, so can, can I just, yep. like, so I, this has been, I'm actually more confused than I was at, like 25 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So God bless Ms. Exton for like keeping us on, like, but I'm actually, I know, I know less now than I feel like I knew 25 minutes ago, right? Because I, I don't even know, like, we've talked about them going by LC, right? But if it's over April vacation, you're not going to find, th like, you're not going to find time to send that many kids. Like, not every kid's going to go if it's over that period. Like, so I guess what's hard is, I, I guess I had hoped that some of this would have happened by the time we came here. That's that that some of this sort of assessment of viability was part of what was done before it came here. Because, like Mr. Thielman, I'm not interested in operationalizing this necessarily, like within this body, right? We clearly, like, we we we're like great people, but we're not the. I don't think we're the people to operationalize this, frankly. So, I'm not really sure. I'm not really clear on where what the next piece is. I, I do think that if there aren't next steps within this committee, I don't think anything will happen. Like, I don't think it'll go anywhere. So I think we have to come up with, with some sort of next piece. Um, but I'm not even really sure what that should be. At this and point. can I just, can I, can I just yeah. say one thing? So this was an exploration. Mm -hmm. So this is by, I was not under the impression that we had to have a fully planned out. This was an exploration to see what's available mm -hmm. and looking at the different vendors and looking at what's, and when we started talking about it happening during like that conversation happened today, when we started talking about the possibility and when you asked the question, if it did take place, it would. But I mean, I don't even know what's possible if we did explore it on uh, like looking at different options, maybe they would go to different sites, I don't know. Hmm. But in order to make this available, I don't know, to your point, I don't think that every child during a midwinter break, just like we have our trips at the secondary level, not every child participates. And so, I mean, I, this is an exploration to see what's possible. And so that was my initial thought, but again, I'm open to feedback and working with the parents to see what's possible. So, I, well, it, it just, it feels like there's a lot of questions and there is a CIA meeting next week if I'm doing, nope, two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just, I'm wondering if, as Mr. Carden said earlier, like that that setting might make more sense for some of this. This is starting to get um, very detailed and we've now been on this topic for 35 minutes and we're an hour off of our agenda. So I'd like to suggest um, that we, this topic get taken um, to the October 24th CIA meeting after Ms. Steffi's had a chance to talk to her board. And then um, we can bring it, Mr. Cardin. Yeah, just, just to frame the ask of you though, is, is right now we're exploring, we're just exploring, let's say, so we're talking about different possibilities. I will use that word right. abundantly no, in the meeting planning. to we're parents. Not, we're not asking for a yes or no. Correct. Are people interested in exploring this? If they're not even interested in exploring it, fine. If there are people that are interested in exploring it, get their names for us. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Is this really important? Well, yes. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. Just to clarify, one of the things you're bringing to your people is asking how much, who, is, who might be 
not just interested, but who might be willing to participate. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. You could do a pilot. No, we're going to move on to the next agenda <laughs> item, and you can continue to talk Thank about you. this on October 24th. Text me and I'll um, Okay. We're now an hour and five minutes off of our schedule. Buffer zone report, Dr. Holman. Oh, can I, t can I thank Ms. Duffy for yes. taking time right, out of her you. very thank busy you. schedule? Thank you for, thank you for so your late, perspective. Ms. Thank you for working with me on this. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Jeff. Done. No. No. Um, good evening. I will be brief with the buffer zone and open enrollment report for 2022. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what exactly this report is for any community members who are watching at home go over uh, the buffer zone assignments and comparisons for this year, a grade level breakdown and some trends. And then I al would also like to talk about open enrollment as a component of this presentation, just to give everybody a sense of what some of the open enrollment trends are as well. So as you all know, um, buffer zones are established, have been established by Arlington, by the school committee in order to um, create boundaries amongst elementary school districts where an elementary school student in that boundary area in that buffer zone may be assigned to either one of the immediate elementary school districts in an effort to um, manage and balance case sizes. And as a component of that policy, I report to all of you once a year on the implementation of it and its effectiveness with a focus on class size equity and um, the impact of the policy on working towards it. So as an overview of the buffer zone assignments and comparisons for this year, um, we had uh, 188 total students who were in buffer zones um, and we had 58 fewer of them this year. That's in line with some of the sort of stabilizing of enrollment trends across the elementary levels and the fact that we had a very large fifth grade cohort mm -hmm. um, head off to sixth grade this school year. Our um, 116 of our families got their first choice of school and 14 families uh, received their second choice. A lot of the students who, or a lot of the families who received a second choice, it was because in the particular grade level they were going into at that school, those classes might either were projected to be particularly large or were at that time particularly large, depending on whether we were talking about this happening in April or in July or August. There's a grade level breakdown available for you. I won't n go through all of these mm -hmm. numbers. Um, we, had, we did have a significant number of kindergartners mm -hmm. in the Bishop Elementary um, in all of the uh, buffer zone areas, but in the, I mean, Brackett Elementary School District in particular, um, we had a smaller number in Hardy than we necessarily expected, and then we had a smattering of students across other areas. I will also note that K-1 and 2 numbers were up slightly this year. This was an enrollment trend as well as a buffer zone trend, and I think reflects um, in the first and second grade in particular both a trend that is real for the district, that families might have their students in a separate school um, and then bring them over in first or second grade, but also could be in second grade in particular an indication of families coming back after pandemic, a couple of years of pandemic learning. So a couple of trends just to note, we had stable kindergarten enrollments compared to last school year. It was actually, um, if you look at some of the projection models that we had for last year, we had more kindergartners than expected only by a few, but it was actually pretty spot on with a lot of our projections. Um, we had fewer new students entering the system this year who lived in buffer zones than last year. And I think actually that's because last year we had such high mobility in town that we had just more students in buffer zones because we had more students moving in. Um, most schools, therefore, had fewer buffer zone, buffer zone assignments this year. Like I said, Brackett had an increase of six assigned students this year. Um, Dallin remained the same as last school year, and Thompson had a slight increase of four. We did, I did make efforts early in the, in the enrollment process to swing away from the Stratton district with kindergarten enrollments um, because we were anticipating some space constraints at Stratton and really wanted to open the art room back up, which we have done even though we are section neutral at Stratton. We did find a way to shuffle some classrooms around and open up the art room again. Um, this is reflected in uh, significantly fewer students who were assigned to Stratton and some smaller kindergarten sections at Stratton now because we actually didn't have the enrollment at Stratton in kindergarten that we expected to have. Um, and there are only slightly fewer assigned to Pierce and steady enrollment at Dallin. Um, there were fewer students assigned to Bishop due to high initial enrollment in K2 classes. So Bishop's enrollments went way up and then 
um, over the last uh, several months of enrollment process, we sort of swept away from Bishop because the sections were getting high. Uh, there was an increase in enrollment in grades one and two compared to the last two years. Like I said, this could be some return of students to public schools after participation in other schools during the pandemic. I'm providing you with a class size overview and comparison, and I think um, some of the, so this is the average class size that you receive on the enrollment report that you receive every couple of weeks. And it's a comparison from October of 2021 to when I pulled the latest enrollment report in 2022. And it's just a class size average comparison. Um, what you can see is what I had articulated is that in kindergarten and second grade, uh, we had slightly higher enrollments than we were anticipating. Um, that we were doing our best to be as efficient as possible with our and in, in using the buffer zones and making sure that we did have as few hot spots in terms of section size and that we were as balanced as we could be with the resources that we had. Um, we did have fewer elementary sections this year and have maintained only having a couple of hot spots um, in the district. And you can sort of see where some of those are. We have some larger class, um, well, they were slightly larger at Dallin earlier in the year, but we have some larger class sizes in kindergarten than we expected because the projections were a little lower than what actually happened. Um, we have a hot spot in fifth grade at Thompson, which we knew was there. We added a section um, in grade five at Stratton, which has brought those class sizes down a little bit, but we ended up having a lot of students enroll in second grade at Stratton this year. So second grade is feeling a little bit of pressure. That's something we can take a look at as we look at sections for next year. Um, but I think overall, uh, what you'll notice is that we've managed to stay pretty balanced, even though we have fewer overall elementary sections this year, and um, that the buffer zones worked well for achieving that. When it comes to open enrollment, this is uh, an open enrollment request that were approved from fall of 2021 to present. So this is not, so we may have more open enrolled students in our schools than this is reflecting. Insofar as if they are a fifth grade student who open enrolled when they were in kindergarten, we don't, we don't necessarily have that data tracked in the way that I would like to. So as we move forward from here, I'll be able to show you with more accuracy exactly how many open enrolled students we have in each school right now to figure that out because we weren't keeping this data in a particular way would require a lot of address analysis um, and it would be very manual. So we've decided not to expend human resources on that, uh, but we're just gonna from here forward start keeping that um, so that we can report this to you. We have more open enrolled students at Bracket than at any of our other schools. Um, and then across the other schools, it's you know somewhere between one and four over the last few years. Notably, um, almost all open enrollment requests are coming from schools that share a buffer zone with the requested school. So, uh, for example, all but one of Brackett's open enrollments come from, came from families with children who were attending a neighboring school, Dallin or Bishop, that has a buffer zone with Brackett. So they would often request, they would not be in the buffer zone, but would request open enrollment at a school that was a buffer zone sharing school with that school. So they're usually nearby. <laughs> Um, the vast majority of our open enrollment requests are coming from families uh, who have some personal circumstances range, uh, that are changing at some point during the elementary <coughs> experience. And most of them are families who moved after their student had established relationships and been at that school for a while to another part of town, or um, something happened in the family and there's shared custody. Uh, but open enrollment requests are largely coming from something changed for me, and so and I want to maintain continuity of experience for my students and stability for my students. Uh, some requests were made that reflect um, a different kind of understanding of the open enrollment policy. We have gotten a few of these who um, they, they might understand the open enrollment policy as a school choice mechanism. Those requests sometimes get framed as motivated by preference for school demographics, class size, um, other factors. Generally, when we receive requests like this, we'll emphasize that we have a neighborhood school model and we'll have a conversation with the family about what some of their concerns might be and what some of their desires might be and talk about what the different schools offer and how they're different and how they're really very similar in most cases. Uh, and so that's sort of how we handle some of those requests. We certainly see the open enrollment because we have a neighborhood school model. We see the open enrollment policy as a way of maintaining stability for families um, and making sure that connections that are really important to students' development aren't broken. 
And those are buffer zone and open enrollment trends for this year. I'm happy to take any questions that folks have. She will let us. Ms. Morgan. Um, do you, because uh, I've, I've been asked this by people, do you only approve open enrollment requests once an address change is finalized? So like I have had people who have said to me, I'm looking, my kids go to school at Thompson. We are looking at a house that would zone us in Hardy. We're not gonna put an offer on this house if my kids can't stay at Thompson, mm. right? And I've sort of been like, I don't know. Okay, so. But like, I guess, how does that, can you, like the 30 second version of what are the, how does that work? So the, the, the process that prompts us to send an open enrollment form to a family is when they change their address officially in the portal in PowerSchool. This is a new sort of process. So yes, I'm not, we wouldn't like sign off on an open enrollment request until the moment that you've actually moved and you changed your address in our system. And then we say, okay, you've changed your address. You would be zoned for this school now. Here's the open enrollment process if you wanna fill this out. During that time, the student is still at their school that they were originally at. Um, however, I do have families reach out to me and basically say, would it be possible for my student to remain at their school? And actually might have been a Thompson, Thompson Hardy example recently. And I'll go look at the data at that school and give them an answer like, yeah, your student's going to be able to stay if your circumstances were to change in that manner. Um, we wouldn't approve the request mostly because they have to put the final address on there. Like we're not gonna go through the operational piece of that, but we'll answer the question for sure. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Schleckman? Yeah, I mean, uh Two questions, basically, and we'll adjourn this to uh, policies meeting. Uh, one is you were talking about requesting a change in the policy where people would just verify that they want to maintain open enrollment. Is this something you're still thinking of? I would be interested in that for exactly the reason I stated related to how good our information is with regards to where all of our open enrolled students are in mm -hmm. the system. We got slightly better information this year because we did ask families mm -hmm. to let us know if they plan to stay open enrolled mm -hmm. in, from the data that we had from last year. Mm -hmm. um, it would be so that we can make sure we're tracking that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel strongly about pursuing it if it's something that the committee is concerned about upsetting or worrying families that they would need to sort of reassert interest in staying open. I don't think it's reapplying. I think it's just notifying. Yep. So I, and, and is there anything within the data as you've been looking at it that made you say, hmm, maybe the buffer zones may, should be aligned a little differently? And you don't have to answer no. that now. If you, you know. Not at the moment. There, yeah. there, there aren't, I can't think of instances where I would propose an adjustment to the buffer zones, but I also haven't done an analysis of the students outside of buffer zones mm -hmm. to compare where there might be enrollment hotspots that would be alleviated if mm -hmm. those students were in a buffer zone. So I'd have, you'd have to look at it, the students who aren't in buffer zones. Because I was here in 2012 when we did the, when we established the buffer zones and there was a lot of thought with, within individual blocks and certain things that were driving us for example, we were worried about students who needed to cross Park Avenue between uh, Dallin and, 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 and Stratton, not Stratton, uh, Bracket. Bracket. Mm -hmm. uh, and the buffer zone for between Stratton and Pierce almost came to the Pierce front door. So that there were a couple of things that we, we were kind of queasy about at that point. And it'd be interesting to see how it settled and whether we made the right decisions then uh, so if something in the data that you pick up uh, would ha result in us needing to think about maybe expanding the buffer zones a little. I, I will reflect on that only to say that the Thompson-Hardy buffer zone and the Bracket-Dallin buffer zone mm -hmm. are two of the most challenging to assign to mm -hmm. because I can completely understand when families don't want to send their children walking to school across park or across Mass Ave. Mass Ave, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes it a lot harder to say to to assign not the preferred school, and by and large, the preferred school is the one on the side of those two streets mm -hmm. because of the walking. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, we'll talk more in subcommittee. Just just a quick point. 
Go ahead. Oh, my next. No, oh. I just try to go ahead because okay. she has it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so the, I mean, the background of this policy was, um, you know, there was there was some controversy and some some discomfort about having a buffer zone policy. Most towns do not have one. I know Newton does, but most don't. Um, it's not all. You know, there's some negatives to it. The two main negatives are there's uncertainty for the families that are involved until you give them their decision, mm -hmm. and you have these these blocks that get split, right? And and one of the one of the, I think there's a second page in the policy that says you're you're supposed to try to not do that. But over the years, some of these blocks have been seriously split. So I think there are some negatives, and you know, we, we you still you said you found it to be a, an effective policy. But that's sort of the framework that we're looking at is, is do the negatives, you know, do the positives outweigh the negatives? Should they be smaller? Can we still get away with it if, if they're smaller? Um, maybe there are some, you know, if you look at the map, there are some blocks that are always going to bracket now. Nobody's going to Dallin anymore. Maybe those should be shifted. Again, you've got so much on your plate, but as a long-term thing, it would be useful to sort of take a look at both the policy and the actual districts. I'll say I understood this much better this year trying to put this report together mm -hmm. than I felt like I did last year. <laughs> <laughs> so in with another iteration, I think it would be easier to do some of that analysis yeah. and, and take a look at whether sort of tightening them would be possible. I will say, though, because this district has so many elementary schools and therefore those, like, section tip points are really tight mm -hmm. that – I can't imagine not having them mm -hmm. under those circumstances. The bigger the school, like if we had five elementary schools right. or six that were much bigger, you have more room mm -hmm. um, to sort of maneuver with stricter boundaries. Yeah. Um, and I can't, I, I definitely see why we moved in this direction. Great, thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey, did you want to? Thanks. Um, I just wanted to point out that when these boundaries were drawn, um, we had the resources of a GIS person on the town side who doesn't, well, he exists, but he's not in that role now. He's not in the town and they haven't replaced, they haven't replaced that role. And the last I checked like six or 12 months ago, they didn't have any necessarily any any intention to replace it so we're missing a resource in terms of doing this efficiently and easily so i understand the requests for dr homan to look at the data and stuff but i want to also point out that we're asking her to do something that wasn't a superintendent type task before in fact it was done by a trained professional um and that we should be careful that we're not asking too much so thank you uh, my my only question you um you wrote the enrollment request requests that were open enrollment requests that were approved are there were there ones that were denied there were not very many um there was a reason I didn't include those, and it's because there were not very many. And some of those situations are challenging ones, and I didn't want to make it too obvious. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, mm -hmm. No, that's fine. I just was curious if they existed. Yeah, there yes. are a few. Okay. Anybody else before I go on? Okay. Superintendent's report. Update. Superintendent's update. All right. So a uh, few strategic planning updates. The initiatives are starting to sh take some shape um, in the strategic planning team. A lot of them have titles and some outcomes. They might not be extremely specific outcomes yet, but they are um, beginning to sort of take some form and we're starting to know, okay, we know we want to work on this and start to outline what this could look like so that we can get some drafts out to the community before they take too much shape. So community forums will start on November 2nd. We had originally planned for one on and uh, on Monday of next week. I'm actually grateful that we had a conflict come up that's going to delay us to November 2nd because I think the initiatives need a little bit more time to take some shape. 
they're a little too nebulous at the moment. Um, but by November 2nd, I'm confident that we'll have some ideas to shop out to the community and to gather some feedback on that will be immensely helpful to the teams that are building these initiatives. Uh, seats are limited to 50 participants for, per form, and we had a lot of folks signing up just today. They'll be formatted as interactive workshops. They're designed to do three things. One is share the new vision and mission of the district with the community. Um, two is to share the equity audit recommendations and give people some time to internalize those and ask questions about them. Um, and three is to gather input on initiatives that will go straight back to the strategic planning team to work on revisions and to incorporate that feedback. Um, so we really want people to take part in this because we have designed the entire strategic planning process to be as participatory as possible and for this plan to be built by our community and we can't do that without feedback from folks so please spread the word i know that it can be really challenging to uh, set aside an evening uh, particularly in the six o'clock hour we did add a forum that's virtual from 7 to 8 30. it's a little bit later it's online um, that one's in December. Hopefully that adds a little bit more accessibility for families. Um, and we really hope to have some good participation. Families only need to attend, or if you want to attend, it's families, staff, students are welcome too. You only need to attend one because they're the same agenda for all four. So mm -hmm. you don't, don't feel like you need to come to all four. Um, an additional forum for staff is being planned. Uh, this says November 9th. I'm actually considering a different date um, and we're working on exactly when that's gonna get nailed down and I'll share it with uh, staff as soon as we're, we have the date. Um, a few playground updates. Uh, I know that this is something that's been on the minds of families at several of our schools. The rubber surfacing for Stratton is scheduled for this week. What is the date today? Yes, next week, early next week. Um, once we once the rubber is down they'll schedule inspection and the opening is still slated for the end of October um, there's also aiming for end of October for Pierce but um, want to be realistic and and not over promise the equipment arrived late which is part of the delay at Pierce uh, due to supply chain challenges but the equipment is on site they're installing mulch this fall and then that's going to get taken out and rubber will be installed next summer um, that's to get everybody onto the playground as fast as possible and then we'll resurface in the summer anticipated opening for that families can expect mid-november and then the bishop playground opened and is um, in use so that's right. great uh, delays just to be clear with the community um, are it can be hard to sort of look at a playground and see that there's equipment there and not see anybody working on it and feel like what's going on. Um, it has not been the result of contractor inaction, but just supply chain and shipping, and they have to um, build the playgrounds in a particular order. So if one thing hasn't arrived, but other things have, they still can't necessarily work on it because they need foundational pieces before they can build on top of that. So the contractor has been very responsive, wonderful to work with, giving us regular updates. Um, and then the Department of Rec has been giving us regular updates. So happy to update the committee and community as needed. A few additional updates. We did have over 500 students try out for fall athletics. One of our students said um, it's been a wonderful start to the season and they're right. Our boys soccer team is undefeated in first place. Our girls soccer team is tied for first place uh, with a record of 9-2 and have qualified for the state tournament. Girls swimming is also in first place in the Middlesex League. Uh, both the boys and girls cross country teams are having excellent seasons and the girls are in the first place in the Middlesex League. Golf is qualified for the state tournament, and we have a combined 70% win percentage. So hooray, fall sports mm -hmm. are going very, very well. Um, we have a new $9 rate for the before school program pilot. We did that by wrapping the pilot program into the breakfast program that we established last year. Um, last year, we decided to offer breakfast at all of our schools. We had previously only done it at some of our schools, but with breakfast fully subsidized by combination of state and federal funding, we didn't see why we wouldn't offer it to all of the kids. So the before care program, we've sort of wrapped at 730 into that breakfast program, along with all of the supervision that goes with it. And we're using some of what we have available from the subsidization of the breakfast and lunch program by state and federal funds to offset the cost of the supervision from 7.30 to 8, <coughs> which allows us to drop the cost for families from 7 to 7.30. Please tell your friends because we would really like to have more students in the before school care program if this is going to be financially sustainable and able to be opened up to any of our other schools. Um, 
we will be uh, members of the senior leadership team. We'll be attending the Deeper Learning Dozen conference. We will be going to three convenings this year. The first one is in Lexington, Kentucky, and we'll be working with the Lexington, Kentucky State Department of Education, which the State Department of Kentucky is actually a member of the Deeper Learning Dozen, so we'll be learning at the state level about deeper learning work that's happening. Um, as a result of that, at the next meeting, Mr. Spiegel is in charge and will be the only one here physically. Uh, myself and Mr. Mason will be on virtually uh, for that meeting. So I just wanted to let everybody know this side of the table will be a little barren <laughs> next time you meet. Um, we did have an amazing set of events for our fine arts students at Arlington High School. Uh, Maestro Alberto Profeta came and he uh, held classes for students. That's a picture on the screen of one of the forums that he held for students to teach them ab about body posture and singing. Uh, and he also did a performance that over 400 people attended here at Arlington High School last week and it received rave reviews and was quite a fantastic experience. So thank you to our fine arts department for making that possible. Update on the CFO search. I anticipate um, that we will have a final candidate to bring forward to the committee very soon. We're working on final steps. We held finalist, uh, confidential finalist interviews with two candidates last week. These candidates had an opportunity to meet with central administration, building and department leaders, um, members of the sixth floor staff, members of the AEA executive team, um, members of the cabinet team. Uh, they talked a lot for many hours and then we let them leave. <laughs> we did feed them lunch though. so. They, they got and they got a break in the middle and they also had an opportunity to meet with me one on one. They also performed a, a performance task that required them to do a monthly report, a projection, an overview of um, town finances in Arlington and to respond to a specific situation. It gave us a really great picture of who these candidates were and I'm looking forward to bringing a finalist to you soon and you have your enrollment reports and your materials. I'll take any questions. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, are we making any progress on the yellow bus for uh, Audison? Yes, the for Audison. Do you mean the electric buses? No, no. The oh, uh, the, oh. Uh, um, right now we are down a bus due to repairs. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mason's not still here. Um, that that would be helpful. But I know we're down a bus right now. We were doing an analysis to see uh, where we might be able to put stops, but at the moment wouldn't be able to implement it because. Mm -hmm. sure down a bus mm -hmm. so we don't have we had a bus at one point we don't at the moment mm -hmm. um, if we do then we might be able to continue pursuing it I've heard from several families about the strain on transportation to Audison um, so it is something we are continuing to look into and pursue but right now we don't have the infrastructure for it mm -hmm. thank you okay. um, thank you dr. Hellman um, so we need to elect an MASC delegate to send to the MASC delegate assembly in November. Uh, Mr. Hainer. I move that uh, Mr. Schlickman represent the Arlington School Committee at the MASC delegate uh, assembly this year. Second. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Nampi? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Thank you for doing that for us. <coughs> All right. <Is> consent. <laughs> All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Um, there was the food services administrative assistant job description has been removed because it wasn't ready. Um, just so you all know. Warrant number 23066 dated October 4th, 2022 in the amount of $730,670.00 and seven cents. Approval of regular school committee meeting minutes September 8th, 2022. Approval of regular school committee meeting minutes September 22nd, 2022. Move to approve as presented. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes, that's unanimous. 
subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Um, budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. We met and we will meet again. Um, <laughs> we discussed a, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think about this, it's been a while. Um, we discussed the budget calendar and have a tentative uh, set up, but need to figure out a few details. Um, that's all I can think of right now, I'm sorry. Um, but that's all, thanks. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. There will be a school committee chat this Saturday, October 15th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. The focus will be the METCO program. All parents are invited to participate. The committee understands that this time is not always convenient for everyone, so there are two additional times during the year, Tuesday, January 10th at 9 a.m. and Tuesday, April 4th at 9 a.m. School, school committee chat dates and times are listed in the school committee calendar and the APS website. Uh, there will be a community relations subcommittee meeting as soon as I get responses back from all the subcommittee members, and we're waiting on one. Uh, thank you. Thank you. CIAA, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we are meeting on October. Hey. <laughs> We're meeting on October 24th at 8.30 a.m. Mr. Schlickman is looking forward to it. We are talking about the literacy work, uh, the strategic plan, and uh, the overnight experience now. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And, yep, uh, we met uh, last week and talked about what was then known as Science Camp, now known as Overnight Experience, and we also talked about strategic planning. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman? No report. Policy and procedures, Mr. Schlickman? I would hope at some point we will hold a meeting that is half as good as the one Ms. Morgan held uh, on, on the science camp. That was, that was probably the best subcommittee meeting I've been to in a long time. Uh, that said, we're... <laughs> no, really, it was really good. I mean, you know. Um, uh, that said, we're accumulating items for, um, for policies, uh, and uh, we're looking at possibly adding a EV charging policy uh, to the mix, and I've asked town council to comment on a, on a draft, and once we get that clear with the uh, town side, we'll bring it over to a subcommittee meeting to see if we want to play with that. Thank you. High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. Mm -hmm. The committee uh, met on Tuesday night and voted uh, to uh, extend the project as the school committee requested, and um, it was a good discussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, superintendent evaluation, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we did meet also. Uh, we, are keep, we are recommending that the committee keep the schedule uh, of the fall of of the fall evaluation and the mid-year um, evaluation that we did that we were they were doing this year, although we'll complete the cycle and and see how, see again how it goes. As far as this upcoming evaluation in in next month, um, I am am tasked with devising a more user-friendly evaluation form mm -hmm. um, that hopefully will be modeled somewhat on your form that you that you came up with um, that will hopefully be more. Uh, palatable, palatable to the committee to use. Thank you. Uh, liaison reports, Ms. Morgan. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey and I attended the long range planning meeting. Um, we're looking forward to the next time when Mr. Cardin will join us. Um, we hadn't met in quite a while, so um, there was a lot of membership change. So, um, but I think given where we're at right now, I think that's a meeting that's gonna happen probably uh, monthly. Uh, starting soon. So we'll try and remember to bring that up um, in the liaison reports moving forward. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. And now, uh, announcement, Mr. Hainer. Uh, I want to commend Dr. McNeil for the outstanding work he has done developing a comprehensive set of professional development courses for the staff. I wish they were that quality when I was a teacher. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Yeah, I would just echo that. I was mm -hmm. reading the offerings, and mm -hmm. it looks like there's something for, for everyone, and I appreciate the continuity across the, the school year. So mm -hmm. we look forward to hearing more about how that goes. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of work already. Mm -hmm. 
um, future agenda items? I had an announcement. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, I wasn't sure everyone was aware, uh, former METCO executive director, Jean McGuire, who's now 91 years old, was attacked while walking her dog in Franklin Park mm -hmm. on the evening of, the, of November, sorry, of October 11th. Um, she's stable, she's recovering at the hospital, um, and the, um, uh, Direct the current president and CEO of METCO, Millie Arbahi Thomas, sent out a memo giving this update, mm. but also mentioned that she, if anyone wants to let uh, Ms. McGuire know what she meant to them and to, to wish her well, that cards can be sent to METCO. Uh, and I've got the address here, I won't read it now, but. Um, I'm sure if anyone in our audience wanted to reach out, um, they can call our secretary and I'll make sure that she has the address um, mm -hmm. or um, our METCO liaison here, um, whose name I'm sorry, I'm forgetting right now. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that and that we hope that uh, Dr. Pitt, that the Ms. McGuire recovers quickly and, and swiftly. Thank you, Dr. Allison Abbey. Dr. Holman? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note that I have a message going out to staff with uh, Ms. Thomas and Ms. Smith tomorrow morning, making sure that everybody's aware that this occurred in case any students have any questions or find out about it, um, and sending our solidarity with the METCO community and wishing her a very speedy recovery. So thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Allison Abbey. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, all right, we need to have, move into a brief executive session um, for an approval of executive session meeting minutes September 8th, 2022, and approval of executive session meeting minutes September 22nd, 2022. Um, we will adjourn from this into executive session and we will be not, not be returning to open session. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by um, Mr. Hainer, roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay.